Hello everyone, Golden Nova here. Over the past year, I've been covering all the archetypes in the World Legacy storyline, and now that they're all done, I've got them packaged together in one gigantic video. Enjoy! What's the deal with World Chalice? Well, that's the thing. This archetype isn't defined by any particular parallel between the cards, but instead how different they all are. There are a variety of types, levels, and attributes, with the only real unifying element being their names, which... yeah... and their Link Monster effects, which we'll touch on in that section. There's also a small, normal monster sub-theme, as denoted by our first three monsters. Crowned by the World Chalice is a level 2 Water Spellcaster monster with 0 attack and 2100 defense. Chosen by the World Chalice is a level 3 Fire Psychic monster with 1600 attack and 0 defense. And Beckoned by the World Chalice is a level 4 Earth Warrior monster with 1800 attack and 0 defense. In the theme, they really are just differently statted monsters so they can work with our other effects, but on a micro level, they have their own little quirks. Each of them can be used for various kinds of Xyz summoning, not to mention as different levels to help with synchro summoning, Chosen can be emergency teleported into play, Beckoned can be roted, and Crowned can, uh... Uh... Um... Uh... Huh. Anyway, next up is World Chalice Guard Dragon, a level 1 Wind Dragon monster with 400 attack and defense, and when a card or effect is activated that targets your linked monster, as a quick effect, you can send this card from your hand or face-up field to the grave to negate that activation, and if you do, destroy that card. You can also banish this card from your grave, then target a normal monster in your grave and special summon it in defense position to your zone a link monster points to. This is another reason to play those normal monsters, as Guard Dragon can reborn them to help you link climb. It also incentivizes you to play other normal monsters that give you some utility, like Angel Trumpeter to gain access to some synchros. And if you use its effect to protect your monsters from a targeted effect, then that's just a faster way to get it into the grave. Also note that it protects linked monsters, not link monsters. So if you have link monsters, but they're not pointing to anything, this card doesn't help them. And on the flip side, if you have a non-link monster, but a link monster is pointing to them, Guard Dragon can be used to save it. It's a very versatile card, able to fill a number of different roles from Protector to Extender, and ain't it just the most precious little baby as it is? Bonk. Lee, the World Chalice Fairy, is a level 2 Light Fairy monster with 100 attack and 2000 defense, and if normal or special summoned, you can add a World Chalice monster from your deck to your hand. And if this card is in your grave, you can send a monster from your hand or field to the grave to add this card to your hand. Thankfully, this is a hard once per turn, so no infinite looping discarding shenanigans here. This helpful little fairy is our Stratos, giving us any monster we need. Sure, half of our picks are normal monsters, but a plus one is still a plus one, and the part of your searches that aren't normal monsters are pretty good. And if you ever end up with a spare normal, then that's just fodder you can use to get Lee back in the fight. That's a pretty callous effect, not gonna lie, but I'm sure that's just a side effect of the game's mechanics. I'm sure sacrificing others for their own gain isn't something that's reflective of the lore, it's just a cute little fairy! World Legacy World Chalice is a level 5 dark machine monster with zero attack and defense. If any number of monsters are special summoned from the extra deck except during the damage step, you can tribute this card to send those monsters to the grave. If this normal summoned or set card leaves the field, you can special summon two World Chalice monsters from your deck except a copy of itself, and during your main phase except the turn this card was sent to the grave, you can banish this card from your grave to add a World Legacy card from your deck to your hand. Now, looking at the stat line, you might think this is the biggest piece of garbage you've ever laid your eyes on. It's a one tribute monster with zero battle prowess. But I promise, this is probably our most important main deck monster. Many of our best plays actually revolve around getting a normal summon chalice onto the board, then sending it away to summon more monsters out of your deck, usually a guard dragon for setup later, and Lee to get you a search immediately. And with extra deck cards like Salomon Great All Mirage, it's not exactly difficult to pull off. So I'd call this a glass all the way full situation. Alright, that does it for the main deck monsters, now it's time to talk about some of their upgrades. While we have a few different kinds of extra deck monsters, many of them are links, so we'll be going over those first, as they're much closer to the core of this strategy. And said links also share a common effect, 
If they're sent from the field to the grave, you can special summon a World Chalice monster from your hand. It doesn't care how it was sent, as it triggers equally well off of being destroyed as being used as Link material, which is the preferred method. Also, uh, this is Recording Booth Nova. I just realized that it doesn't say anything about having to be sent from the main monster zone. It just has to be on the field and then sent to the grave. So if you ever equip one of the World Chalice Links, this does trigger the effect, I believe. So um, for anyone out there looking to make custom World Chalice cards, uh, this is a design space that has not been used. Starting us off is Imduck the World Chalice Dragon, a Link 1 Wind Dragon monster with 800 attack, requiring any normal monster that's not a token as material. And considering how prevalent tokens would be later on, that, um, that restriction makes sense. During your main phase, you can normal summon a World Chalice monster in addition to your normal summoner set. And at the start of the damage step, if this card battles an opponent's monster this card points to, you can destroy that opponent's monster. So it's like an El Shadal construct. A very, very specific El Shadal construct. But that effect doesn't mean anything if your opponent doesn't summon monsters to the right zones. The important part is that extra normal summon. Remember how Chalice is a bit difficult to summon being a one tribute monster? Well, as it turns out, it's actually stupidly easy. Just take any of your normal monsters, even an off theme one, turn them into Imduck, and now you can tribute Imduck for the summon of the chalice. And bonus, this will trigger Imduck's summon effect to get another monster out of your hand. At this point, you can all mirage the chalice away, or if you got the extra summon from Imduck, you can make a link too which will then trigger Chalice's Grave Effect. This card is amazing and is going to be a huge part of your best combos. And they're still so cute! Look, its new collar is a charm that looks like the World Chalice. I'm calling it. This is the best Yu-Gi-Oh! Doggo. Ib, the World Chalice Priestess, is a Link 2 Water Spellcaster monster with 1800 attack, requiring any two monsters with different types and attributes. This linked card can't be destroyed by battle or card effect, and your opponent can't target this linked card with card effects. If any monster this card points to would be destroyed by card effect, you can send this card to the grave instead. That's kinda wild, not gonna lie. Like, as long as Lib is pointing to or at a monster, it has all three of the major kinds of protection. Targeting, battle destruction, and effect destruction. It's basically a stone's throw away from being a towers, and it can provide a bit of protection to anything it points to. But with that stat line, it unfortunately doesn't have what it takes to be an offensive powerhouse, so you won't be able to leverage those protections into something more aggro. Instead, it'll usually end up being a very protected monster that you can trade in to give protection to another card but you could make it more offensive with some buffs. Also, its sideways pointing arrows aren't always the best for when it comes to link climbing, so you'll usually be making this later on in your combo, but once you get Eve into the main monster zone, your ability to link summon opens up dramatically. It might seem like a difficult card to use at times, but it's all about reading the Eve and flow of battle. Aram, the World Chalice Blade Master, is a Link 2 Fire Cybers monster with 2000 attack, requiring two World Chalice monsters as material. It gains 300 attack for each World Legacy monster in your grave with a different name, and you contribute a World Chalice monster this card points to, then target another monster in your grave and special summon it to your zone this card points to. Now, point of order, this boost is derived from the amount of World Legacy monsters in your grave with different names, not World Chalices, so the only card that helps you on theme with this is World Legacy World Chalice. If you want more buffs, you're gonna have to branch out into that theme, which we'll talk about in a later video but the Revival effect is the important part of this card. It can Monster Reborn any monster. It just needs to tribute a World Chalice monster this card points to. So anything you splash in is fair game, from extenders to utility pieces to even boss monsters. It can even get Ib back into the main monster zone, like I said earlier, right where you need them. This is definitely a card you're gonna wanna check out. Ningirsu, the World Chalice Warrior, is a Link 3 monster with 2500 attack, requiring two or more Link monsters as material. If this card is Link summoned, you can draw cards equal to the number of World Chalice monsters this card points to. And once per turn, you can send a card from each player's field to the grave, which makes this a much slower DPE. And it doesn't even destroy, which to me sounds like a plus, though I'm under no delusion that this is clearly the early build. It can also help you regain card advantage, which is very welcome because, as it turns out, summoning monsters from your hand over and over again is going to exhaust your resources real fast. It also just needs to point to World Chalice monsters, not World Chalice Link monsters, so it's a little lenient in that regard. And if the links you use to summon Ningirsu were other World Chalice ones, you can layer your 
effects where you resolve the summon from hand ones first, helping to make sure Ningirsu's link points are filled up before the draw resolves. This is a pretty neat payoff that gives you the ability to not only remove a problem card your opponent has, but potentially get rid of a floodgate on your side of the field that you don't want to deal with anymore, or can trigger other effects. You can even activate this as Chain Link 1, then chain a normal trap or quick play spell, then just have Ningirsu send that card to Grave, basically making this a free effect. And as a Link 3, it makes superb material for Access Code Talker, so you never have to worry about finding yourself without a powerful game ender, because with Ningirsu, there's nothing to spear, but spear itself. Alright, now it's time to talk about some less pointed monsters in our theme. World Chalice Guard Dragon Almer Duke is a level 9 Wind Dragon Fusion monster with 3000 attack and 2600 defense, requiring 3 Link monsters as material. It must first either be Fusion Summoned or Special Summoned from the extra deck by tributing the above monsters you control in which case you don't use Polymerization. This card can attack all monsters your opponent controls once each, and when an attack is declared involving this card and an opponent's Link monster, you can banish a Link monster with the same Link rating as that monster from your field or grave to destroy that opponent's monster, and if you do, inflict damage to your opponent equal to its original attack. Hey, looks like we're bringing back that pseudo-construct effect. And it's not once per turn either, so as long as you have matching Link monsters in your grave, you can keep burn destroying your opponent's monsters. And because we have so many different ratings of monsters, we're likely to have a match. Though you can still just attack everything, even if your opponent doesn't have any links, it's still gonna be pretty saucy. I also like that you can tribute the monsters so you don't even have to play a fusing effect if you don't want to, and even makes for a neat super poly target if need be. Though, now that we're in Master Rule 4 revision and links aren't quite as necessary for extra deck use, it's a tad bit less useful. It's probably the best game ender we have on theme, because it's more than ready to put up their Almer Dukes. Ib, the World Chalice Justiciar, is a level 5 water spell caster synchro tuner monster with 1800 attack and 2100 defense, requiring generic material. But for this card synchro summon, you can treat a World Chalice normal monster you control as a tuner. If this card is synchro summoned, you can add a World Legacy card from your deck to your hand, and if this synchro summoned card is sent from the field to the grave, you can special summon a World Chalice monster from your deck or grave, except a copy of itself. Ooh, now this is a wild one. While World Chalice never really broke into the competitive meta, this card by itself was a nightmare to contend with, because it's basically a combo in a box that almost any deck could use. If you had access to level 5 synchros, and even if you didn't have it inherently, there were a few engines you could tech in to get there, it was a free search and a free floating effect. And while our monsters themselves aren't very powerful, they cover a wide variety of types, attributes, and levels, so you could just find a card that fits your combo. You could even use it in a variety of ways. Link summoning was the easiest, of course, but as a synchro tuner, not only could you just synchro climb, it gave you access to cards that specifically needed synchro tuners. But now, no one has to worry about it because this card is banned. I know some people want it back, it's a pretty neat tool and it does suck that World Chalice can't use it, but considering its wide array of utility in almost any deck, it's hard to justify Judiciar's return. This leaves us with a couple spell cards. Now, they're World Legacy cards, but they do revolve around Chalice, so they're good to go. World Legacy's Heart is a normal spell card that targets two World Chalice monsters in your grave with different names and adds them to your hand. And if your linked Link monster would be destroyed by a battle, you can banish this card from your grave. This is going to be integral to keeping your hand stocked up for those Link climbing plays, because like I mentioned with Ningirsu, your hand isn't exactly a large resource like the deck or grave so you're bound to run out of cards eventually. It's also good at helping you recover if you're low on resources regardless to get your plays jump started, and the Grave Effect is a nice extra touch. It does require a bit of setup on board, it only works on Link monsters that are also linked, so it's not quite as forgiving as Guard Dragon, and an observant opponent might find a way to sequence around that protection, but it's better to have it than not. Though, Effect Destruction Protection would be pretty neat. Just saying, this card is more than 5 years old at this point, and Effect Destruction was pretty rampant then. Don't even get me started on now. Tier Laments just casually pop cards with their field spell, can you believe that? The art also shows a pretty cool function of the World Chalice. It can change sizes to fit any situation, which means it can fit in any cup holder! Truly an artifact of legend! 
World Legacy Discovery is a field spell card that grants a 300 attack and defense bonus to all your World Chalice monsters. Once per turn, if a face-up World Chalice monster you control is destroyed by battle or leaves the field because of an opponent's card effect, you can target a World Chalice monster in your grave and special summon it in defense position, which means it can't revive those cool, cool Link monsters. Oh well. It was the dawn of the Link era, they had to pull the brake somewhere. It's pretty nice for what it is, basically adding a little extra floating effect to your monster to help you keep your board presence live, not to mention a nice little boost, which can even summon Almer Duke back to retaliate on your next turn if it, you know, comes to that, but otherwise doesn't really help your game plan in the short term. And as a combo deck, the short term is basically your entire game plan. It's some really nice artwork, and I'm sure it helped out a lot of duelists during those pre-release tournaments, but in the modern game, I'd be surprised if anyone discovered a use for this. Alright, that's all the World Chalice cards, but what do we do with them? Well, I feel like World Chalice is more defined by what options the deck has for Link Summoning, rather than its own roster. True, Ningirisu is good removal, and Almer Duke can kick serious butt, however any generic Link monster is easily within our grasp, and that means we're going for aggro, using monsters like Axis Code Talker and Boral Sword Dragon to close out the game on the spot, while leveraging cards like Trigate Wizard to give us some protection and interruption going first. So what can we play to help them out? Well, they are members of the World Legacy storyline, so it's only proper to give those cards a look to see which ones mesh with our playstyle. This is by no means an exhaustive list, so if there are any that I left out that you feel work with the theme, uh, feel free to share them below. Lib, the World Key Blade Master, is especially good in our deck, as one of our on-theme monsters is a World Legacy one, so at any point after you link Chalice off, Lib is completely online and gets you any World Chalice spell or trap card, not to mention that using it as a link climbing tool can spin a card. And the card you're likely to be getting is World Legacy's Successor, because it is a Monster Reborn, and we do love Monster Reborns. Some of our other World Legacies are pretty good too. World Crown is a free summon from hand to help with our Link summonings, and can provide some control if you keep it on the field. And World Lance is a hand trap that's gonna let you win basically any battle. World Legacy's Sorrow is an Omni Negate, though none of our monsters inherently co-link, so you'll need to make sure you're running off-theme choices to help out with that. And World Legacy's Landmark can turn a special summon chalice into fresh monsters if you don't want to have it stick around for its negation, and can even help with Ningirsu's draw effect. What about other Link monsters? Well, one cycle of cards I think works really well with us are the Charmer Links. Since we play every attribute, besides Divine, we can access whichever ones we want that can take advantage of our opponent's grave. For instance, Beckoned can be used to make Alsa to steal Fenrir's, while Chalice can enable Dark to summon well, you name it, darks are everywhere. Though, using six extra deck slots to have all six charmers on standby is a little much, so you should tailor your roster to fit whichever meta you expect to battle against. Though, uh, maybe keep area on hand just in case you run into Umi control. As for other Link monsters, we've already talked about how Access Code and Boral Sword are great game enders, Trigate Wizard has cool control elements, and All Mirage is a good Chalice enabler, but we can also utilize a ton of cards that are otherwise big material sinks. Appaloosa, Unchained Abomination, Saryuja, Mechnet Crusadia Avermax, even Underworld Goddess of the Closed World. IP Mascarena is also a must run, as its granted protection makes all of our payoff links that much better. Defender of the Labyrinth is pretty funny considering all of our normal monsters and can provide a nice debuff to our opponent's monsters while making Beck into a 2300 point monster. Link Spider is very helpful if your hand is flooded with normal monsters. Pentastag can give Almer Duke piercing, making its multi attack hella lethal. And of course, we can't forget all the things you can do with nightmares. Heck, if you want to play World Legacy Sorrow, they're the best way to make sure you have co links. Since we have some normal monsters, we have some tools to turbo material out of our deck. While emergency teleports can summon Chosen, it's a bit limited, especially if you don't tech in any other targets for it, so Unexpected Die is the preferred option. And with all the link summoning we'll be doing, I think this is one of the few decks that can run Pot of Avarice. After people stop playing Beast Deals and Ishizu cards, that is, we can easily churn through 5 or more monsters in a single turn, so having a way to reset our cards is a must. In fact, we do it so much, you might want to keep a Digusto Emerald on standby just in case. And it even pulls Double Duty as a way to summon back our normal monsters. 
A little engine that's really funny in this deck is the Agent of Creation Venus. This was one of the big high roll cards that was being trotted about when Link Monsters first came out, and works especially well with us. The Shine Balls can be converted into Link Spider and Imduk specifically in that order, and from there you can do basically whatever you want. I mean, right there you have Venus, Link Spider, Imduk, and a Shine Ball, which gets you a maximum power Saryuja. And by using Transmodify, you can actually special summon this card by using Lee as the base monster. It's really wild. And things almost got way worse with the printing of Agent of Destruction Venus. Uh, thank goodness its effects do lock each other out for the rest of the turn. Though I suppose you could just summon it out of your hand with Saryuja, so I guess we're not out of the woods yet. As for a silly tech pick, my mind is set on Five-Headed Link Dragon. Our multi-attribute deck puts us in a great position to summon this card with its bonus effect, letting us wipe our opponent's board before attacking with a 5,000 point body. And if any deck has the ability to bury five cards for a few turns to keep this online, it's this deck. And imagine linking this off for access code talker, absolutely iconic. And that's all I have to say about World Chalice. I don't feel like its power level has stood the test of time, but is probably one of the most fun I've had with Link climbing in a good long while. And I think that counts for something, especially as a way to get people into the vibe of the mechanic. And honestly, the deck is only as good as the cards it can link into. And with the way Link monsters keep getting more and more generic, we're always on the cusp of this being the shell of a Link good stuff deck that generates an absurd amount of value. It also kicked off one of the most endearing storylines Yu-Gi-Oh has had to date, eschewing just about everything about Dual Terminal and still managed to tell a story just as engaging in a fraction of the time. And that takes skill, especially with how our story is shared. So everyone, I'd like you to join me in giving three cheers to World Chalice. So what's the deal with crawlers? Well, they're a series of earth attribute insect type monsters. Many of their names refer to parts of brain cells, which lines up with their in-lore trait of having a hive mind. The main deck core monsters are all level two and all have flip effects, while sharing another effect. If this face-up card in its owner's control leaves the field because of an opponent's card effect, you can special summon two crawler monsters with different names from your deck in face down defense position, except another copy of itself. This is Kind of odd design considering this is the deck that wants to have their monsters hit the field in face down defense position. Shadal's got around this by having a templating that forced your opponent into a lose lose situation. Either you remove the face down monster with an effect, triggering a Shadal effect, or attack into it to trigger a different effect, usually a worse one. But left as is, you can effect remove a crawler while it's in face down defense position and no one will bat an eye. Though the idea is that you want your opponent to think they can do this, then flip your crawlers up with a quick effect from another card, though broadly looking at them you'd hardly know this was the case. Let's start with Crawler Axon. They have 500 attack and 1800 defense, and their flip effect can target a spell or trap card on the field and destroy it. Have you ever wanted a mystical space typhoon that was also a monster? Well now's your chance. It also has the fun distinction of being able to destroy your own spells and traps, so if you have a card you want to trigger a destruction effect on, or you have an annoying floodgate you no longer want to deal with, Axon can axe it. Crawler Dendrite has 1300 attack and 1600 defense, and their flip effect can send a monster from your deck to the gr- Whoa, whoa wait hold up, send a monster from your deck to the grave? Not a crawler monster! A monster. Um, wow, uh, I guess you can print stupid broken stuff on cards as long as you make them flip effects, huh? Well, uh, if you ever wanted to splash crawlers into a deck that loves graveyard effects, this crawler's the dend right one for the job. Crawler Gleal has 700 attack and 1500 defense, and their flip effect can special summon a crawler monster from your hand or grave in either face up attack position or face down defense position, except a copy of itself. So if you run into this crawler, they get replaced by another. And if you have a setup grave, this is probably one of the best monsters you can summon off of the generic crawler floating effect, since it'll handle Gleal of your needs. Crawler Ravnir has 1100 attack and 900 defense, and their flip effect can target up to two crawler monsters in your grave and add them to your hand. Now that seems a little slow, since we normally need to take two turns to reset those monsters, unless we want to use them as discard fodder for something. But trust me, we actually have a card that combos with this to speed things up. Which is great, because otherwise we're moving ahead at a crawl. 
Crawler Receptor has 900 attack and 1200 defense, and their flip effect can add a Crawler monster from your deck to your hand, which is another really good starter. Receptor gets flipped, add Gleal, flip Gleal, summon back Receptor. You can keep doing this for as long as you have copies of them, or you just search into another crawler that can do some problem solving. Either way, they're all part of a big helpful team, so they'll be treated to a warm reception. Crawler Spine is kind of the mascot of the theme, and they have 300 attack and 2100 defense, and their flip effect can target a monster on the field and destroy it, which seems like a weird name if they're supposed to be named after brain cells, so I looked it up and it's referring to Dendritic Spine spines, these little feelers at the end here. So it's less backbone spine and more porcupine spine. <laughs> oh, we rhyme to ignore the fact that man -eater bug has been power crept out of existence. Sometimes I miss old Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay, now it's time to talk about our really spicy crawlers, and this first one is the one everyone's doing a wig out over. Crawler Soma is a level 6 monster with 2000 attack and 2500 defense, and while this card is in the hand, they can target a face-up monster you control, special summon Soma from the hand, and if you do, change that monster to face down defense position. Also, it can't change its battle position for the rest of the turn. And during your main phase, you can reduce this card's level by 2 or 4. And if you do, special summon crawler monsters with different names from your hand, deck, or grave, whose total levels equal the amount reduced, in face-up or face-down defense position. Now, why is this making everyone go ballistic? Well, for the main deck cost of running three Soma and two differently named level 2 crawlers, you can put Utopic Draco Future on board, plus prime any of your crawler flip effects to go off whenever you'd like, with the added bonus of getting to use any flip synergy your own deck might have. Here's how it works. Get one of your monsters on the field however you want, then flip it down while special summoning Soma. Use its effect to summon two crawlers, at least one of which has to remain face up. Now Soma is level 2, at which point you can exceed summon Ghost Trick So Cute Boss. Yup, we're doing it again, Ghost Trick community! You get the added benefit of popping a monster with 1300 or less attack, then you can overlay for Angel of Mischief, detaching the So Cute Boss to get shot, which will revive So Cute Boss, make another Angel of Mischief, using its effect to search Ghost Trick Scare, then overlaying both into Utopic Future, then upgrading them into Utopic Draco Future. Set the scare, and now you can activate the effect of the face down crawler next turn whenever you'd like. And if the monster you flipped face down does something good when flipped, then all the better. Granted, this means you're also using up 5 extra deck slots and 2 more main deck slots for shot and scare, but this play sequence only shows off SOMA the cool things you can do with this card. Deus Ex Crawler isn't just one of the most famous immersive sims ever made, it's also one of our most special monsters. They're level 9 and have 2000 attack and 3000 defense, and when your opponent activates a card or effect that targets this face down monster as a quick effect, you can change this card to face up defense position to negate the activation. And if you do, destroy that card. That's right, we've got another weird monster that has an activated effect while face down. Absolutely wild. After this card has been flipped face up while it's in the monster zone, negate all monster effects activated on your opponent's field. This works kind of like a one-sided skill drain, except it's actually better, because it negates effects activated on the field, not the effects of monsters that are on the field. So while this doesn't stop continuous effects, even if those monsters leave the field as cost, like Prank Kid's Battle Butler, Deus here will still stop it. And if this card on the field is destroyed by battle or card effect, you can add a level 9 monster with a different original type and attribute than this card from your deck to your hand. That last part is more to keep it in line with the level 9 World Legacy Monstrosity monsters, but if you're running Prediction Princess Tarot Ray, then I guess you have an extra searcher for them. Deus Ex Crawler is one of the most threatening things about crawlers right now. Triggering a single one of the level 2's floating effects gets you a 3000 defense body that resists targeted interaction, and if you manage to flip it up, your opponent's entire monster lineup freezes. No DPE effect, no Borrowload Savage, no Wandering Griffin Rider, everything gets tanked. That's not to say it's impossible to get over, there are some big monsters in the extra deck, not to mention you can still clear it out with spells and traps, but barring access to those, Deus Ex isn't just this card's name, it's also what's going to have to happen for your opponent if they want to out this. Now, this next one isn't a crawler, but I'd be remiss if I didn't bring them up. 
See, each of the World Legacy archetypes has a World Legacy monster that was released alongside, or around the same time as them, that's meant to support and work with that archetype. And for Crawlers, that's World Legacy World Armor, a level 7 Dark Machine monster with 2500 attack and defense. And when a monster is Flip Summoned, you can Special Summon this card from your hand. Cue the Flip Summoned Crawlers summoning a giant suit of sci-fi mecha armor from the sky. Now, while this doesn't trigger when your monsters are flipped up in general, you have to to legit flip summon them, this also triggers on your opponent's flip summons. So if you book them and they try to get their monster back in fighting shape, they're in for a nasty surprise. If this card is normal or special summoned, you can add a World Legacy card from your deck to your hand. And if this normal summoned or set monster is on the field as a quick effect, you can target a face-up monster your opponent controls that was special summoned from the extra deck, and return both that monster and this card to the hand. Yeah, that's one of the weird quirks with World Legacy cards. Many of them have an effect that only applies if they were normal summoned or set, even though that's incredibly resource intensive, especially compared to what effects they give you. However, ignoring that, when you do get the free special summon, you get a card out of it. And in a deck of monsters with very, very low attack stats, running world armor gives you the offensive push you need to actually close out games. Trust me, it makes a world of difference. Alright, that's all of our main deck monsters, now it's time for the extra deck ones. And like their main deck counterparts, they share a few similarities. On top of still being earth insects, they're all link 2, and if they're destroyed by battle while face up, or leave the field because of an opponent's card effect while under their owner's control, you can target two crawler monsters in your grave with different names and special summon them in face down defense position. This means you can't float your link crawlers into more link crawlers, but it can revive deus ex crawler, so keep that in mind. First is X-Crawler Nuragos, a Link monster with 1900 attack, requiring any two insect monsters as material. While on the field, Crawler monsters this card points to can't be destroyed by a battle, gain 300 attack and defense, and if they battle your opponent's monster, any damage they inflict is doubled. Now, this can work in two different ways. Either you set a crawler in a zone that Neurogos points to, in which case you are highly telegraphing that it's a crawler so your opponent won't attack into it, or you make another link crawler at one of those link points so it has an attack stat worth leveraging that double damage effect. Heck, you could make two Neurogoses that point to each other, so neither can be destroyed by a battle and they both deal double damage. Now, pointing fingers is rude, but pointing arrows at each other, that's just common courtesy for crawlers. X-Crawler Synaphysis is a link monster with 1800 attack, requiring two earth monsters as material. Crawler monsters they point to can't be destroyed by a battle, gain 300 attack and defense, and can make two attacks on monsters during each battle phase. Looks like somebody got jealous about math mechs and decided they wanted to be a big battle archetype too. Point this at a monster that Neurogos is pointing to and you'll have a double attacking, double damage dealer before for too long, granting so much power that, honestly, is gonna leave me needing a synapsis after we're all done here. Our last monster is X-Crawler Quailiarch, a Link monster with 2000 attack, requiring any two crawler monsters as material. Uh, this isn't really related to anything, but this does mean that these Link monsters have the same kind of material patterning as Bujins. One of the monsters needs specifically named material, one needs the theme's attribute, and the other the theme's type. Uh, non-beast warriors notwithstanding. Anyway, Quailiarch has accumulating effects, depending on the number of crawler monsters you control. If you have two or more, all of your monsters gain 300 attack and defense. If you have four or more, your opponent can't activate cards or effects during the battle phase. Note that this isn't one of those Armades type effects that only restricts effect activation after attacking. It's the whole battle phase, so your opponent isn't going to be able to wait until the start step of the battle phase and sneak something through you. Once both players agree to move to the battle phase, they are locked out. And if you have six or more, your monsters can attack directly. Now, this does perform a bit of a non-bow with Neurogos and Synaphysis, since they're double attack attack double damage effects can only be done through monsters, but their attack is so much higher than your main deck monsters that if you can manage to enable the direct attack while linking up into them, I'd still recommend it. And this has all gotten a lot more accessible thanks to the introduction of Soma. Super combos aside, they're a great way to get a free Link 2 onto the board by themselves, giving you quick access to Quailiarch, and thus, a way to get your other Link 2s into the main monster zones to start granting battle buffs. I also like how the 6 plus effect lets you direct attack, tying into how a horde of these things could just overrun your defenses by sheer numbers alone. If you've ever wanted a Zerg Rush in Yu-Gi-Oh, this is how you do it.
Alright, that's all of our monsters, now it's time for the spells and traps. And something you might notice pretty quickly is that we don't actually have very many that are name stamped to our theme. A lot of the spell and trap support among the World Legacy archetypes is just under the umbrella World Legacy name, which means that they can sometimes overlap with each other, leading to some interesting combinations. First, we have World Legacy Survivor, a normal spell that depicts the one surviving crawler after their battle with the World Chalice crew, who will one day become extremely extremely adorable, and I want 80 plushies of them. It excavates the top 5 cards of your deck, and if you do, add any excavated crawler monster or world legacy card to your hand. Also send the remaining cards to the grave. If you can't, you just shuffle all those excavated cards back into the deck. And regardless, for the rest of the turn after this card resolves, you can't special summon monsters from the extra deck except Link monsters. Oh no, whatever will we do? We can only summon the highly generic and flexible Link monsters. Uh, sarcasm aside, this is a great way to get you to your support cards or crawlers that you might need, all the while filling up your grave. There isn't much on theme that cares about the grave, mind you, but if you mix them with something else, you might get some fun benefits. Heck, since it excavates, you can make Crawler Sylvans. The combination of insects and plants would make Naturia proud. World Legacy in Shadows is our deck's field spell, and it grants all of our crawlers a 300 attack and defense boost. Once per turn, you can special summon a level 2 or lower insect monster from your hand in face up or face down defense position. Once per turn, you can special summon a level 2 or lower insect monster from your hand in face up or face down defense position. And when your flip monster is destroyed by battle with an opponent's monster, you can send that opponent's monster to the grave. Youch! Talk about a battle deterrent! It doesn't destroy, it doesn't target, it just sends. And you can even trigger this yourself. Usually there'd be some kind of restriction, like it only triggers if your opponent attacks, but you can crash into your opponent's monsters on your turn and get that trade. It's also nice to see that it helps turbo out your crawlers from hand, though it sucks our opponent will know what we set, kinda ruining the element of surprise. A quick, someone tech in shifting shadows, we need to maintain our tactical advantage. World Legacy's Mind Meld is a normal trap that activates when your opponent opponent activates a monster effect while you control a crawler monster, changing that effect to return one face-up monster your opponent controls to the hand. You can also banish this card from your grave to target a link monster on the field to special summon a crawler monster from your hand, deck, or grave to your side of the field to a zone that target points to in face-down defense position, but you can only use one effect per turn and only once per turn. I'm... I'm torn on this. Effect replacement is usually so good, and while there are a lot of things worse than a non-targeting compulsory evacuation device, this is one that doesn't target and we have very little synergy with this effect. If we have a Link monster on board, this sets us back something fierce. I can't imagine why this wasn't change one of your opponent's defense position monsters to attack or something like that. Heck, even your opponent chooses a monster to return to their hand would have been something because then you could put a crawler back into your hand that you could set later, but this, this is just, at least the grave effect exists, and it works great with Survivor. While it can't turbo out our links because the summon does have to be in face down defense position, it still gets a monster on board, and if we have an effect that flips monsters up, then we're off to the races. Hmm, speaking of mind meld wonder what that little guy is thinking. World Legacy Pawns is a continuous trap that lets you target a face-down defense position monster you control and change it to face-up attack or defense position, an absolute godsend for this deck. As I mentioned earlier, you can flip up your monster in response to removal to get all of the benefits, or just flip them up to get their effect as needed. You can also shuffle a crawler monster from your grave into your main deck, so no recycling links, then target a face-up monster you control and change it to face-down defense position, letting you reset your crawlers for more effects. Or to dodge stuff like Effect Veiler, really, Book of Moon can help you do a lot of things. However, you can only use one effect per turn and only once per turn. Yeah, you want to see this as early as possible because it makes your deck a lot more proactive and lets you combo even more with Soma. While the monster you flip down can't change its battle position, that only means it can't be changed manually, so pawns can still flip it up and you get the effect trigger. The second effect can also be used to flip down Soma because once you flip it back up, all of its levels come back, so you can use the effect again. 
Though, uh, I think we need to call a judge about what's going on in the card art here. I don't think they give you enough zones to summon that many crawlers. Our last card is Crusadia Crawler, a continuous trap that special summons itself as an effect monster, though is still treated as a trap card. And they're a level 2 earth insect monster with 300 attack and 2100 defense, exactly like Spine. And if this card is special summoned to a Zona Link monster points to, you can add a world legacy card from your deck to your hand. So even without dipping into the Crusadia half of this card, you can just summon this to a point one of your own Link's point to and get Survivor, which can search you another card, or can get you pawns so you can flip up your monsters on your terms. And from that point, it's a free special summon to help with your Link summons. Or, if flipped face down because of pawns, it'll return to your spell and trap card zone, at which point you can reactivate it, summoning to another Link pointed zone to get another search. And bonus? After looking more thoroughly at the art, it looks like Crusadia Crawler gets a little version of Crusadia Maximus's crown that's so precious! So that's all the Crawler cards, but what do we do with them? Well, we're not exactly a powerhouse, but if Quailiarch, combined with our general control effects, are any indication, we want to drag out the game until we can summon a whole horde of Crawlers, attack directly with all of them, ending the game on the spot. To that end, we're gonna need a lot of swarming and a lot of stun, so what can we play to help them? out. Well, it might be useful to look at other World Legacy cards and see if any of them help out our game plan. As with many Link decks, World Legacy Succession can get you a monster out of your grave, and is searchable off of Survivor. Hey guys, Christian the Editor here, just popping in to let you know real quick that in terms of World Legacy Succession, if you want an extra way to search it, Lib the World Key Blade Master is always an available option to you, provided you use something like World Legacy World Armor or World Legacy World Crown in your deck that you can use as Link material, and then be able to climb up into that Lib later. Once you have Lib established, you can search for something like Succession or Survivor to be able to use immediately during that turn or you can even search for an extra tech like World Legacy Awakens that will allow you to link summon on your opponent's turn after getting your flip effects off of your trap card for max efficiency. And if you use that Awakens to link off your Lib the World Key Blade Master and another monster into a Nightmare Unicorn, you can actually end up getting two spins back to the deck off of that one discard instead of just one. So the extra bang for your buck is definitely worth the effort. That was all I had for you. I just wanted to stop in and let you guys know that little detail really quick. World Legacy Secret can alternatively summon back Soma and Deus Ex, and if you flip them down with any of your effects, it's no longer tied to Secret if it gets removed from the field. And if you somehow link up into Mech Knight Crusadia Avramax, then you've got a zone that you can negate monster effects in. World Reassembly ain't half bad either. It'll summon out World Armor, which can then search you a World Legacy card. And since it blows itself up during the end phase, it won't get in the way of Quailiarch. A theme I always like to see splashed in with flip decks is Prediction Princess. Tarot Ray is extremely searchable with pre-preparation of rights and acts not only as another World Legacy Pawns, but revives one of your flip monsters during each of your end phases. It won't revive Deus Ex Crawler because it's technically not a flip monster, but it can revive Pot of the Forbidden if you want to go that deep on flip effects. Or a, you know, revive Gleal and then use that to revive Deus Ex Crawler. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. How about Insect Support? Well, Bee Trooper is probably the biggest name in Insects right now, but much of it doesn't really gel with our playstyle. However, Sting Lancer is a free summon that can search you Fly and Sting, which is a monster negate. Dragon Bite is an interesting new TCG exclusive. It gets another crawler out of your hand, and you can banish an insect to increase the level of a monster you control by that monster's level. So you can make that crawler level 4, and since Dragon Bite is a tuner, you now have access to level 8 synchros or rank 4. Exceeds. Shadals are all flip monsters, and with the help of Soma, you can link your crawlers into Shadal Construct, which gives you access to Shikinaga while also giving you a repeatable trigger for your Shadal monsters. Alternatively, you can also summon Subterra Behemoth Fiendus, which can summon more crawlers out of your hand and search you more of them. As for a silly tech pick, while Maneater Bug might be out of contention, Mimicking Maneater Bug is pretty sweet. They can't be destroyed by battle, and it absorbs the attack of whatever it destroys, making it potentially very big. It can also take on the type of what it destroyed, and can be destroyed by effects of any monster that matches its type. Which is doubly hilarious, because while Mimicking is still mandatory, if you make it target itself, it won't be destroyed because it's its own type. It's so amazing. 
And that's all I have to say about crawlers. These little units haven't made much of a splash, which makes each new card that comes out that much more interesting. Are we in for a new age of fortune for flip fanatics? That remains to be seen. Honestly, we're much more likely to see the rise of Soma being teched into various decks to act as a special summon engine. Thankfully, there isn't much one can do with level 2 monsters, so you don't have to worry very much about- Oh, come on! So what's the deal with Mech Knights? Well, they're a series of light attribute psychic type monsters, and all of our level 5 and higher members can be special summoned from the hand to a column that contains two or more cards in it once per turn. And that's why people are so protective of their zone placements now. If you set a spell or trap card in one zone and summon a monster in that same zone right in front of it, then you just made a mech knight column that can be summoned in for your opponent. And that wouldn't be too much of a problem if the monsters summoned were pushovers, but the more fearsome of the mech knights came with impressive stats and amazing tutoring effects, giving them the ability to swarm a field that's been properly set up for them. And thankfully, mech knight pilots have plenty of tools to force the issue. But before we talk about them, check this out! Okay, with that out of the way, let's talk about Girsu the Orcus Mech I'm kidding, I'm kidding. First off is Mech Knight Avram, a level 4 normal monster with 2000 attack and 0 defense. Oh, what a meme. Oh, what a hilarious meme you've become. Like, yeah, the flavor text is already pretty funny without any context. It's very tonally mismatched. But doesn't it feel weird that after the elegant prose of the world chalice normal monsters, the only chance we have here to learn more about the cards without looking up a guide is just three simple words? Well, your sense of discomfort is right on the money. While we only have fan translations to go on, this isn't even close to the original. Let me read this to you. The hero who defends the light of the stars must destroy the darkness of the illusory world and entrust his power to the Chosen One. The will inherited by the Chalice of the Stars will become a new key and become the sword that cuts down darkness. See? Doesn't that just sound like the next chapter of an epic tale? Now all we have is this. Oh well, aside from that, it's a nifty unexpected die target to help build up your link material and makes for a nifty light to add to your magic key deck. Okay, we've checked it out, let's move on to the next one. Girsu the Orcist Mech Knight is a level 4 dark machine monster with 1800 attack and 0 defense, and if this card is normal or special summoned, you can send an Orcist or World Legacy card from your deck to the grave. Then, if there are two or more cards in this card's column, treat this card as a tuner this turn. And if you control no other monsters, you can special summon a World Legacy token, which is a level 1 dark machine monster with 0 attack and defense, to both players' fields and defense position. So this breaks basically every convention about what a Mech Knight card is, and that's because we found ourselves with another product of being a lore card. World Legacy actually did a lot in pushing the boundaries of allowing cards to be part of multiple archetypes, but I'd be lying if I said this saw equal play in both Mech Knights and Orcist. Sending Orcist cards directly from the deck to the grave is a huge boon to that theme, whereas turning into a tuner does little more than serve a lore purpose, as you can tune this and the token you make into Ib the World Chalice Justiciar which you can't even do anymore. But that's not to say that Girsu has no Mech Knight synergies. Bit of a spoiler here, but by sending World Legacy World Chalice, it can be banished from the grave on following turns to search basically any of the relevant World Legacy Spell or Trap cards that Mech Knights would use. And while giving your opponent a free token can be bad in a lot of situations, this does give you the ability to manipulate columns to your benefit. If you set a Spell or Trap card in the same column as the token you gave to your opponent, et voila, you've got a viable column for summoning Mech Knights. And besides, you get a token to use for whatever you want, which is just music to my ears. Alright, now it's time to cover the core monsters of the theme. Mech Knight Blue Sky is a level 5 monster with 2000 attack and 2500 defense, and if this card is normal or special summoned from the hand, which includes its own summon procedure, you can add Mech Knight monsters with different names, except copies of this card, from your deck to your hand, equal to the number of your opponent's cards in this card's column. This is easily one of our best monsters, clocking in with some respectable stats and some major searching capabilities. At worst, you'll be summoning this to a column that has one of your cards in the extra monster zone and one of your set spell and traps, which results in no searches. However, if there is even a single of your opponent's cards in that column, you get one search, two if they've got two, and if they have the vaunted extra monster zone, a monster underneath it, and a spell or trap card beneath that, that is a total of three searches. 
Proper use of Blue Sky can turn the tide of battle all on its own, getting you back into a game where you had no resources, or absolutely burying your opponent while you're ahead, leaving nothing left in the wake of a horde of giant psychic monsters. Who knew a single animation studio could do so much? Mech Knight Green Horizon is a level 6 monster with 2100 attack and 1600 defense, and when an attack is declared involving this card and an opponent's monster in this card's column, you can target a Mech Knight monster in your grave and add it to your hand. So, for making sure your column matches up with your opponent, you can recycle one of your monsters, which is pretty neat. The battle doesn't even have to go your way, nor do you even have to be the one that declared the attack, meaning you could put your opponent in a situation where you still get some advantage for battling. Its 6 star level is also pretty relevant at time of recording, as rank 6 monsters are better than they've ever been, pair well with level 2 tuners to make powerful level 8 synchros, or you can use level 4 tuners to make some truly outrageous ones. On the surface, this card seems pretty mid, but in Yu-Gi-Oh, you never know how powerful a card can be, since new cards that can work with it are always just over the horizon. Mech Knight Orange Sunset is a level 6 monster with 800 attack and 3000 defense, and if an opponent's card in this card's column is destroyed by battle or leaves the field, you can special summon a Mech Knight monster from your hand. Out of all our monsters, Sunset is probably the most situational. Most Mech Knight decks are going to run tech cards that are meant to help get them out of the hand naturally, so they'd rather play something with a bit more utility than a monster that just summons more knights reactively. The 3000 defense is nothing to scoff at, though you'd think they'd give it more attack since it has an ability that triggers on destroying monsters by battle. But I did want to take some time to focus on the effect trigger. Since it cares about cards leaving the field in its column, along with them being destroyed by battle, it does mean that if they play a normal spell card in its column, this will actually trigger Sunset, so it's got a little magical musket vibes going on here, so keep that in mind just in case. But to be fair, not sure what you would pair with this to make it really good. It's about as hard to find synergy with orange as it is to rhyme with it. Mech Knight Red Moon is a level 7 monster with 2300 attack and 2600 defense, and it can banish a Mech Knight monster from your grave, then target a face-up monster in this card's column, and destroy it. Notably, this effect is not once per turn, so if you drop this into an extra monster column, you could potentially wipe out two monsters, one after the other. Unfortunately, it still says you have to target those monsters, so you still can't get around that kind of protection, even though this effect could allow for a more lenient templating. Honestly, I was expecting something more. Magic has Blood Moon and Alpine Moon. You're telling me you couldn't have even a little bit of stun going on here? Step up your game. Come on. Mech Knight Yellow Star is a level 7 monster with 2200 attack and 2800 defense, and like Red Moon, Yellow Star can banish a Mech Knight monster from your grave, then target a spell or trap card in this card's column and destroy it. This is also not a once per turn effect, but has a bit less utility once you remember that you can't put more than one spell or trap card in the same column. Uh, unless your opponent is summoning trap card monsters, but I doubt you'll be side decking to deal with the Odeon Turbo matchup. Honestly, this is more disappointing than Red Moon, having even less of an effect on the board state, and relying a lot more on its level and other attributes to hopefully help as material for other summons. And this time, I'm not even able to make a reference to some iconic card from another card game to round things out. I'm done with this. Mech Knight Indigo Eclipse is a level 8 monster with 2400 attack and defense, and once per turn as a quick effect, you can target a Mech Knight monster you control and move that target to another of your main monster zones. That's right, Move Man is here! Silly joke effect and all. Except, as it turns out, this effect is probably one of our most important. See, if your opponent is playing conservatively and not committing many cards to their board, it'll be hard to find opportunities to get our Mech Knights out of the hand, and that's where Indigo Eclipse comes in. If there's only a single column available, you can summon Indigo to it, use its effect to move itself to another column, slide to the left, and the column that was previously occupied by a Mech Knight is now empty, leaving you room to summon another Mech Knight. This also helps to line up your other effects. Red Moon and Yellow Star can be repositioned so they can remove cards, Green Horizon can be set up to trigger its battle effect, and Sunset can be moved out of nowhere to the same column as a resolving spell card to get that trigger for its effect. And being a level 8 monster that's easily summonable is no laughing matter either, because the rank 8 pool is stacked. Seriously though, how funny is it that the Column Changer eclipses half the other monsters in this theme? 
Mech Knight Purple Knight follows a level 8 monster with 2500 attack and 2000 defense, and as a quick effect, you can target a Mech Knight monster you control and banish it until the standby phase of the next turn. And if you do, add a Mech Knight monster from your deck to your hand, except a copy of itself. Much like Move Man, this can facilitate the summoning of more Mech Knights by clearing out cards temporarily, but the twist here is that Purple Nightfall guarantees you'll have that card to summon once the effect resolves. The downside is that you don't get to keep the body on board for the rest of the turn to use it as part of an offensive push, but nothing stopping you from swinging in with it first, then bouncing it. Or heck, just keep it around until your opponent's end phase if you want to keep the blocker up. That way you get to keep a 2500 point body on board so your opponent has to deal with it, and you still get your shiny new toy. It's also got the ability to banish any of your mech knights, not just itself. So while it's slower than Move Man, it also allows you to realign your monsters. The Purple Nightfall into Blue Sky into more Mech Knights line has overwhelmed more duelists than I care to admit, and allows you to tutor out your more situational monsters as needed while playing your best ones at the maximum allowable copies. Now you can focus your efforts on tutoring out some normal gosh darn hands. Seriously, y'all are built like scythers, opposable thumbs aren't that bad, you know. Alright, our main deck roster is covered, now it's time to go over our extra deck choices. Starting with Mech Knight of the Morning Star, a Link 2 machine monster with 2000 attack, requiring any two monsters, including a Mech Knight monster as material. If this card is Link Summoned, you can discard a Mech Knight monster or World Legacy card to add a World Legacy card from your deck to your hand. And if your Mech Knight monster battles a monster in a different column than it, your monster can't be destroyed by that battle, also you take no battle damage from it. This makes for a pretty useful hand fixer to set up your future plays that's easily summonable by Girsu, while being an excellent bridge into our next monster. The battle protection is also very funny because it's basically Waboku for anything that's not in your column. So if your opponent doesn't summon to the correct zone, they'll have to use effect removal to get your mech knights off the field, because battle isn't going to be very profitable, especially if you've got move man waiting in the wings to slide a mech knight out of a dangerous column. It's a pretty cool card, but I'm gonna be honest, I'm always distracted by the legs. Why did they make them like this? Are those somehow knee joints? Why would you build them like this? Who hurt you? Mech Knight Spectrum Supreme is a Link 3 Cybers monster with 3000 attack, requiring two or more Mech Knight monsters as material. This card can attack directly if it's the only card in its column, and if this card in the extra monster zone points to no monsters, it can't be destroyed by card effects, and also your opponent can't target it with card effects. You can send one other card you control in this card's column to the grave to special summon a Mech Knight monster from your deck in defense position. Here it is folks, despite the fact that this uses at most three materials, this is the combination of all seven of the original Mech Knights. Grandiose in design, this gigantic amalgamation is ready to swing in for a huge chunk of damage, completely uncontested. As long as it's not contested by literally any other card in its column, which seems weird to me, they normally love having other things in their column. But if its arrows are clear and in the EMZ, it's a pseudo towers. Battle and non-targeting, non-destruction effects can still work on it, but everything else is a non-issue. You'll also want to commit to only spending spells and traps for its summon effect, as putting a monster in its column does leave it open to interaction while it's in there. This is a pretty savage boss monster that's now easier to make than ever before, thanks to the release of Morningstar, and while it's still not the best thing you could be doing, saying that you attacked your opponent for game by using the Pride Laser is it's pretty dope. Mech Knight Crusadia Avramax is a Link 4 Cybers monster with 3000 attack, requiring two or more monsters special summoned from the extra deck as material. While this Link Summoned card is on the field, your opponent can't target this card with card effects. Also, their monsters can't target monsters for attacks, except this one. Once per battle during damage calculation, if this card battles a special summoned monster as a quick effect, you can make this card gain attack equal to that opponent's monster's attack during that damage calculation only. And if this Link Summoned card you control is sent to your grave by an opponent's card, you can shuffle one card on the field into the deck. And it doesn't even target. Avermax means business. This is another crossover card, this time with the Crusadia theme, but here's the weird thing. There's absolutely no connection to the Mech Knights in this card at least insofar as the effects are concerned. It doesn't really care about columns, rather just funneling all attacks towards it, and beating the heck out of anything that wasn't normal summoned. And even mostly things that were. 
But I ain't complaining, cause this card is ridiculously powerful. Usually paired with IP Mascarena to add effect destruction immunity on top of the targeting one, this card is played in all kinds of decks for how generic and powerful it is, and will even come with a sweet retaliatory effect if your opponent is somehow able to clear it. It may not be much of a Mech Knight card, but it is still one heck of an anime protagonist. Look, they've even got blue hair! You gotta have blue hair! Okay, the extra deck is out of the way, now it's time for the spells and traps. Like with most members of the World Legacy storyline, we don't really have any on-theme spells and traps to work with, but rather a number of World Legacy cards that name-check our theme in their effects. And we're gonna start with one of the best, World Legacy Memory, a quick play spell card that special summons a Mech Knight monster from your hand or deck in defense position, but return it to the hand during the end phase. And for the rest of the turn after this card resolves, you can't special summon monsters except Mech Knight monsters. So yeah, free Mech Knights right out of your deck. It can summon a blocker to keep your life points safe, get you more material for your Link Summons, enable cool effects. All of these things are possible with Memory, and because the restriction only applies after you resolve this effect, you can summon whatever you want beforehand. Though keep in mind that this won't trigger Blue Sky if you summon it from the deck with this. All in all, this is a solid card that will help you keep the big monsters flowing, even if your opponent isn't being cooperative. But now I've gotta wonder how the purely memories interact with this, I can practically smell the purely or canon in the dual terminal storyline short now. World Legacy Key is a continuous spell card that, when activated, lets you target one of your banished Mech Knight monsters or World Legacy cards and add it to your hand. And while on the field, it negates any opponent's trap effect that activates in the same column as a Mech Knight monster you control. Ooh, do I sense a bit of S-Force gameplay going on here? Uh, keep an eye on that templating for later, but suffice it to say, this helps keep your opponent from flipping a ridiculously powerful trap card and wiping you out. And with the power of Move Man, you can actually swap one of your Mech Knights into the associated column because this negates as part of the resolution. So as long as your Mech Knight is there at that point, that's all that matters. It's also another great application of memories, as it turbos out a Mech Knight into any column on your field so you can stop things like Evenly Matched. Oh, and it also gets you back the monsters you banished for Red Moon and Yellow Star, but that's not exactly this card's key feature. World Legacy Scars is a field spell card that grants all Mech Knight monsters on the field a 300 attack and defense boost. Once per turn, you can discard a Mech Knight monster or a World Legacy card to draw a card, and you can banish 8 Mech Knight monsters with different names from your grave and or face-up field to send your opponent's entire hand and extra deck to the grave. Wow, now that's pretty goofy if you can manage to pull it off. With the addition of new Mech Knight monsters over the years, you now have a deeper pool of names to choose from to help with this, but I've been tricked into something like this before. Deskbot Base has a similarly brutal effect that never works out the way you want it to. In this situation, it turns out there's a lot of decks with good grave effects, even in the extra. Who knew? But honestly, I think it's good enough as a small attack boost and a way to rummage for cards. Seriously though, what is the lore team's obsession with setting post-apocalypses in dilapidated cities covered in foliage? There are other settings for this kind of thing, you know? World Legacy Whispers is a continuous trap card that, when activated, targets a level 5 or higher monster on the field, and it gains a thousand attack and defense until the end of this turn. And while on the field, Whispers negates any opponent's spell effect that activates in the same column as a Mech Knight monster. Having a conditional Imperial Order ain't half bad, and the boost caring about the level means you don't have to slap this onto a Mech Knight necessarily, you could put this on any high-level monster you choose to splash in. Still, despite the fact that it answers spells, the activated effect just ain't worth it a lot of the time, especially because it's not permanent. Honestly, I'm just more concerned about Lee's projectors. Uh, are they okay? World Legacy Secret is a continuous trap card that, when activated, targets a level 5 or higher monster in your grave and special summons it, and when this card leaves the field, destroy that monster. And while it's on the field, it negates an opponent's monster effect that activates in the same column as a Mech Knight monster you control. That makes this a surprise breakthrough skill. As a monster effect activates, you just flip this up, summon a Mech Knight to its same column, and that monster isn't doing anything. I'd also like to point out that, while Secret leaving the field will destroy the monster associated with it, the reverse is not the same, unlike similar cards, namely Call of the Haunted. So if you lose the monster, you still get to keep your kind of skill drain. Of this trio that negates cards based on Mech Knight placement, this is probably the best, as it revives your powerful monsters and provides monster effect negation, one of the most powerful forms of negation in the game. Also, yeah, uh, Lee is evil. How'd you all not know that? It 
wasn't exactly a secret. Okay, that's all the Mech Knight cards, but what do we do with them? Well, with a mix of powerful monsters and disruptive interactions, mid-range is the way to go for us. Identify when your opponent has overextended, catch them in your stun trap, then turbo out all the Mech Knights you can for a clear win. Along the way, we'll try to find other monsters and column synergy that gives us an edge the competition can't jack from us. So what can we play to help them out? The best thing about a deck that's full of monsters that inherently summon themselves is that your normal summon is wide open for just about anything you could ever want. And you know what that means, Alistair the Invoker. But I'm probably not the first person you're hearing this from. Invoked Mech Knight was a very powerful deck back in the day, as Alistair searched Invocation, which you could set to set up one of your columns to summon a Mech Knight, and once you had finished those plays, you could flip that Invocation over to use any Link material as Fusion material, with Invoked Mechaba being the frontrunner to summon, what with all the lights. Negating and banishing cards is hard to pass up, especially since you can revive Mechaba with secrets. Alistair also comes with the added bonus of giving us access to some useful Link 1s, as turning this mage into Almirage or Artemis Magistus helps make a viable column. Because even without your opponent's involvement, having a monster in the EMZ and setting that invocation right below it gave you a viable Mech Knight column. Kaijus are also another huge boon to the deck, regardless of if you use Invoked. This simultaneously gives you the ability to deal with towers or monsters with annoying on-field effects, and because you decide what zone the card is summoned to, you can set up that Kaiju wherever you wish. But don't feel like you have to limit yourself to just Kaijus. While strong, we do have other, more powerful polymorphers that have the drawback of taking up your normal summon. But as we've established, that's not really a huge deal. While it may seem counterintuitive, to use cards like Lava Golem and Winged Dragon of Raw Sphere mode to clear out more monsters, thus robbing you of useful columns, sometimes there are setups that demand an answer before you pop off. Iron Dragon Tiamatron is also a really funny card to add into the deck, as it gives you some unexpectedly powerful removal. It can be quick summoned from the hand as an effect if there are three or more cards in the same column, which you can easily do once you plop a Mech Knight into a column that has two or more already, but it doesn't have to be summoned to that column. Then it destroys everything else in this card's column, and keeps both players from using anything in those zones. A great application is locking off your opponent's EMZ once you've taken the other one, just to make sure your opponent doesn't clear out the one you have so they don't take it. Like with all our World Legacy archetypes, checking out what other World Legacy spells and traps work with us is a great idea. Succession is, of course, outstanding. With all of our links, the ability to reborn material is stupendous, and a great way to access it is via Lib, the World Key Blade Master. It's easily summonable off of Girsu and its token, and it even sets up all of Lib's effects. By sending World Legacy World Chalice from deck to grave, letting you search for Succession once you get them, on top of any of our Mech Knight-related World Legacy cards, and then once you've had a chance to use that World Legacy card, you can then link off Lib to shuffle an opponent's card back into the deck. Chalice has already shown its chops, but what about some other World Legacy monsters? World Shield protects all World Legacy cards in its column, not just monsters, so you can use this to keep secrets safe. World Crown gets you more material for your summons, specifically for Morning Star, or can just sit on the field to negate an extra deck summon. World Arc is a reactive reborn for any of our links in the face of effect destruction from our opponent, and World Gears of Theological Demiurgy is a cracked card if you can get the material for it. The Mech Knights will cover Psychic, World Crown covers Machine, so as long as you run another level 5 or higher monster that, hint hint, you can revive with secrets, you have a monster-based towers that can wipe the board every turn. World Legacy Clash kind of works along with our game plan, giving us a temporary banish a la Purple Nightfall, but instead of a search, you massively debuff a monster. And of course, World Legacy Trap Globe is a slower but arguably better Pot of Avarice, since it recycles banished cards, doesn't target, and is thus a lot harder to interrupt. Another amazing card that lines up with our column gameplay is Beast King Unleashed. You're already summoning monsters to columns that presumably your opponent has full of cards, so by declaring an attack with this, you're just bouncing every other card in that column. It will bounce back your own cards, including the Mech Knight that triggered this, but considering how easy they are to summon, it's not really difficult. 
and as a continuous trap card, it can actually help you set up those columns for later. And it's not once per turn, it's once per chain. So the more Mech Knights you can field, the more of your opponents you can rip away. And since this triggers at the start of the damage step, you can actually be a little cheeky with this. Once this is face up, your opponent's probably going to want to summon two different columns to avoid the effect. But when they go to attack one of your Mech Knights, just chain Move Man's effect to move the attack target into that column, and there you go, you've got your bounce. As for a silly tech pick, how about some Psy Impulse? It fulfills the requirements of being a normal spell to help set up your columns, and it can really screw up your opponent's card economy. If you do this going first, your opponent will still get to draw up to a fourth card, but essentially puts them down two cards from the six they could have possibly had. And for trading a spell and a monster to accomplish this, that's a pretty good rate. Though it does get worse the more hand traps your opponent makes use of, as well as how long the game goes, since hand sizes tend to dwindle as the game continues. If you want something a little less silly, try Psychic Tuning. It's a more restrictive secrets with less utility, but it does turn the summoned Psychic into a tuner. Not only does this give you some funky synchro options you otherwise wouldn't be able to make, like Barone, sinking a blue sky into another non-tuner blue sky, you could also send them to the grave to make Ultimaya Zulkin. Set another card, and that gets you a Crystal Wing. But why stop there? Summon back Move Man and get Purple Nightfall, and that's Ultimil Bish Balkan. Have fun with all those tokens! And that's all I have to say about Mech Knights. This theme is so sick, easily splashable with a strong core of cards, enabling big bodies and easy material, with tools you can add during particular formats to give you removal. While not particularly strong now, I don't think it's out of the question that we'll be seeing this archetype in the future to bolster other strategies. So despite their cold, intimidating appearance, they're more than ready to be your Mech Knight in shining armor. So what's the deal with Nightmares? Well, our extra deck monsters share two mechanical through lines. One, they're all fiends, and two, they're focused on co-linking, which as a quick reminder, is when two link monsters' arrows point back at each other. This can be up and down, side to side, or the rare diagonal co-link, which is very fresh. And this manifests in a couple different ways. One, if Link summoned, they can discard a card to activate an effect, and usually a pretty powerful one at that. But if they're co-linked when that effect is activated, you get to draw a card, basically making the effect free. Except it's better than free because now you're setting up your grave while digging deeper into your deck for more cards. Lovely. But what makes them so untenably powerful is how generic they are. Their effects were, in general, of great utility at an affordable cost. But their link material is what's important, as it usually boils down to monsters with different names. This meant they were useful at any stage of the game and could fit in almost any deck, immediately power creeping a ton of cards out of the format. If your deck is in need of monster removal, just run Cerberus. Back row removal? That's what Phoenix is for. Recycling spell and trap cards? You've got Griffin. And because they have growing link ratings, you can literally link climb through all these options instead of having to start from scratch for each one. It's hard to fully express how bonkers that is just by telling you, but trust me, Nightmares have had a long lasting impact on deck building since their release, which is pretty impressive for an almost five year old archetype. Oh, and on top of all of that, they also have continuous effects that apply to all co-linked monsters. And it doesn't even care if the monster that gives the effect is part of the co-link. Very generous. This is why the Nightmares all keep their arrows to the cardinal directions. It's a lot easier to line them up that way. As for the lore, this one's pretty fun. See, we've actually kinda covered these monsters before. Mech Knights. You see Lee making one of the most out of left field, unpredictable, totally out of character heel turns in all of gaming history, takes over Eve's body to in turn take control of all the world legacies. And all the power cores of the Mech Knights are really gonna help out with that. So Eve, now Ibli, takes all the cores and fashions them into new friends, the Nightmares. Get it? Cause they're made from the Mech Knights? Mech Nightmares? It's fun, we have fun here. Now, since the links are so important to the theme, we're actually going to start with them before we cover the main deck cards. So we're kicking things off with the only member that has no legs, Nightmare Mermaid, a Link 1 Water Fiend monster with a thousand attack, 
requiring any Nightmare monster you control except a copy of this card. If this card is Link Summoned, you can discard a card to special summon a Nightmare monster from your deck, then draws you a card if it was co-linked on activation. And all monsters on the field lose a thousand attack and defense unless they're co-linked. That's a pretty substantial debuff, making all of our on-theme monsters legit bruisers if we can keep them all co-linked up. But that didn't really matter much because it barely stuck around on the field to take advantage of that, because it was far more useful for its summon effect. While it wasn't used for it initially, once Orcus Nightmare was released, another example of how mixing archetypes could lead to big leaps in power creep, Mermaid became a vector towards building some of the strongest and most resilient boards in the game, with many strategies devolving into who could assemble the Orcus combo the fastest. And that's what got this card super banned, and has remained so to this very day. So despite being a very flavorful card from a mechanic standpoint, this card was mermaid to be broken. Nightmare Goblin is a Link 2 Wind Fiend monster with 1300 attack, requiring any two monsters with different names as material. If Link summoned it during your turn, you can discard a card. If this card was co-linked when this effect was activated, you can draw a card. Also, during your main phase this turn, you can normal summon a monster from your hand to your zone this card points to, in addition to your normal summoner set that turn. And neither player can target co-linked monsters you control with card effects. That's right, it's a double summon from the extra deck. I wonder where we've seen that before. All you had to do was make sure that Goblin wasn't in the EMZ and Bob's your uncle. So would it surprise you to learn that this card too is banned? That's just how it goes, I guess. If you're not flu under ease, you are not allowed to get extra normal summons. The targeting protection was also probably too good to keep around. That kind of protection for free could be absolutely brutal. However, despite all that, I really want to see this card come back. And not for any balancing reasons. I just want to go goblin mode again. Nightmare Cerberus is a Link 2 Earth Fiend monster with 1600 attack, requiring two monsters with different names as material. If Link summoned, you can discard a card to target a special summoned monster in your opponent's main monster zone and destroy it. Then you draw a card if it was co-linked at activation. And co-linked monsters cannot be destroyed by card effects. Remember, this only hits monsters in the main monster zone, not extra, and only hits special summoned monsters. But since those categories cover, um, basically any monster you would want to get rid of, it's still supremely playable. And honestly, it's hard to talk about Cerberus without its partner in crime, Nightmare Phoenix. It's a fire and has 1900 attack, and its discard effect has it targeting an opponent's spell or trap card and destroying it, also drawing you a card if it was co-linked at activation. And it keeps all your co-linked monsters from being destroyed by battle. These two are probably the easiest tech picks to slot into any extra deck if room is available. Having the option to fold any two of your monsters on field, plus a discard into some spot removal of your choosing using is hard to pass up, especially for decks whose main weakness is that they don't offer permanent removal. They truly are two great tastes that go great together. A firebird and a three-headed dog, um, what a classic. Nightmare Unicorn is a Link 3 Dark Fiend monster with 2200 attack, requiring two or more monsters with different names as material. And if Link summoned, you can discard a card to target any card on the field and shuffle it into the deck, then draw a card if it was co-linked when the effect was activated. And while any co-linked Nightmare monsters are on the field for your normal draw during your draw phase, you draw a card for each different name among those co-linked Nightmare monsters instead of drawing just one card. Yeah, it gives you multiple draws in a draw phase what in the world is going on here uh, I am actually overblowing it a bit. While it sounds busted on paper, this hardly ever comes to pass. Mostly because this makes for such good link material for our friend access code talker. But we're not doing Yusaku Explained yet. For our purposes, it's enough to know that Unicorn is an easily summonable out to basically anything. Not only does this make for an excellent follow-up to either Cerberus or Phoenix, it bypasses destruction protection and grave triggers by putting the cards back into the deck. And in some very niche scenarios, you might actually want to point this at one of your own cards to put them back into the deck to be used for later. Unicorn can often be seen next to Phoenix and Cerberus in the extra deck as another easy to access piece of removal. And I mean, what can I say? Uh, cliches are cliche for a reason, even if they are a little unicorny.
Nightmare Griffin is a Link 4 Light Fiend monster with 2500 attack, requiring two or more monsters with different names as material. If this card is Link Summoned, you can discard a card, then target a Spell or Trap card in your grave and set it to your field, but it cannot be activated this turn. Then you can draw a card if this card was co-linked at activation. And Special Summoned monsters on the field cannot activate their effects unless they're linked. I guess it was too much to keep with the co-linking requirement, but understandable, as this would be just an automatic hit against all non-link monsters. But it still makes for a stupendous floodgate regardless. But it does require your opponent to go into a link monster before they can use their special summon monster's effects, so that's something. And that's not all the floodgating you can get up to. Griffin has the ability to reset any spell or trap card in your grave, meaning you can grab any floodgates that end up in your grave and use them later. This allows you to recycle ones that have been dealt with previously, or ones that you sent to the grave on purpose with cards like Foolish Burial Goods. Or, you know, you could grab back a utility spell or trap card like someone who's not trying to ruin everyone's fun. Your choice. But you look me in the eye and tell me that's not the look of a monster who just got a huge kick out of flipping summon limit after the second summon. Okay, all the extra deck monsters are out of the way, now it's time for our main deck ones. Hmm, uh, nope, I don't feel comfortable doing it in that order. Anyway, Nightmare Corruptor Ibli is a level 2 Dark Cybers monster with zero attack and defense, and when normal summoned, you can target a Link monster in your grave and special summon it to your field so it points to this card, but change its attack to zero, also negate its effects. While on the field, you can't special summon monsters except Link monsters, and if this card in its owner's control is sent to the grave, you can special summon this card to your opponent's field and defense position. Oh, now this can lead to some shenanigans. While this can revive any of your nightmares, you can also summon anything with a sideways pointing arrow, though it'll only be useful as link material at that point, since all of its power is gone. More often than not, this is used to mess up your opponent. By linking this into Lingaribo, you can give Ibli to your opponent, and now they're stuck with it. They'll either have to use their own Lingaribo to get this off the field, and most of the time they won't have one, use a normal summon and then link that away with Ibli, or just crash this into one of your monsters, effectively skipping their battle phase while hopefully doing a big chunk of damage. Trust me, anytime you see this, know that your opponent is up to shenanigans, and any format where this is prevalent basically means everyone's playing a 14 card extra deck featuring the 15th Lingaribo as an out. It's a rough card to see, but is honestly one of the funniest floodgates on the market, and can really give certain decks a new Iblis on life. Orcus Nightmare is a level 7 Dark Machine monster with 100 attack and 2000 defense that can't be destroyed by battle with Link monsters. You can banish this card in your grave, then target a face-up monster on the field, and on resolution, you send a Dark Machine monster from your deck to the grave except a copy of this card, and if you do, the targeted monster gains attack equal to the level of the sent monster times 100 until the end of the turn. But for the rest of the turn, you can't special summon monsters except Dark ones. So this is effectively an Orcus card, it doesn't really do anything for nightmares proper. In fact, really the only reason this is part of the nightmare archetype is because of the interaction it has with Mermaid to help your Orcist combo lines. One which might I remind you does not exist anymore. In the future, when the inevitable Orcist Explained happens, you can go jump over to that video and learn more about what this card is all about, but for now, I'd like to point out just how graphically horrifying this card is. It's got multiple arms coming out of the same joint, it's got a blade for an arm, it has a face growing out from behind Galatea's face? It's even got the analog horror face going on. Nice touch. Nightmare Incarnation Idli is a level 9 Dark Fairy monster with 2100 attack and defense that prevents all level 9 monsters you control from being destroyed by card effects. If the total link rating of monsters on the field is 8 or more as a quick effect, you can special summon this card from your hand, and if this card is special summoned while your opponent controls more link monsters than you do, you can send all link monsters on the field to the grave. So this technically makes Idli a hand trap that you can drop on the field if your opponent gets too frisky with their link monsters. In fact, the link rating needing to be 8 or higher is probably a reference to how that's the minimum amount of link rating you need to set up a traditional U-style extra link. Once again, this is really more of another themes card, though in this case it's more of a loose association of level 9s across multiple themes, so it doesn't really do much to help us out here. But at least it has the decency to try and pitch in. It's the at least it could do. 
Alright, that's all of our monsters, now it's time for the spells and traps. Once again, these are World Legacy cards on the tin, so we'll be looking both at cards that mention nightmares, or rather the one that mentions nightmares, as well as anything that looks for co-links since that's kind of what this archetype's whole gimmick is. First up is World Legacy's Nightmare, a field spell card that prevents you from taking damage from attacks involving your co-linked monsters. And once per turn, you can activate one of these effects. Either move a Nightmare monster you control to another of your main monster zones, or switch the location of two Nightmare monsters in your main monster zone. So instead of giving any kind of attack bonus, this largely just lets you set up your co-links. I mean, that's pretty nifty, but these kinds of effects really should be tacked on to other abilities that actually do something. But hey, uh, good for Ningirsu here, the XP they're gonna get for soloing this mob is gonna be clutch. World Legacy Struggle is a normal trap card that targets spell and trap cards on the field, up to the number of co-linked monsters on the field, and destroys them. Notably, this counts monsters on both sides of the field, just in case that comes up. I guess it's a nice bonus for setting up your field, but with all the compounding bonuses you get for co-linking your nightmares, I'm not sure if adding a card that only deals with back row is really necessary. Like, I'm struggling to think where this would be considered good. World Legacy's Sorrow is a counter trap card that you can activate when your opponent activates a spell or trap card or monster effect while you control any number of co-linked monsters. You negate the activation, and if you do, destroy it. Now this I can get behind. Uh, not the ib unaliving part, the Omni Negate. Especially because, as a World Legacy card, it is searchable. So you can grab this to keep your board set up, or sneak this into your opponent's combo lines to prevent their game plan from firing off. We unfortunately couldn't use this in time to negate the whole Lee possessing ib thing, but that's the tragedy of running counter traps, you always seem to get them one turn late. Alright, so that's all the Nightmare cards, but what do we do with them? Um, nothing. Nightmares aren't exactly a deck that you can build, but rather, it has pieces you can tech into other archetypes. So, instead of going over what cards work to bolster Nightmares, let's check out some other tech picks you might want to consider if you're already playing Nightmares. First off, we've got our World Legacy Spells and Traps. Succession is, as always, a pretty sweet include, because on top of it just being a Monster Reborn, if we link either Cerberus or Phoenix away for Unicorn, we can reborn them under Unicorn in the EMZ to get a co-link going. We don't get the draw, but we do get the benefits of the continuous effects, and that's sometimes more than enough. I bashed the field spell for only being a vehicle for moving monsters, so what if we added a little extra utility with World Legacy Clash? We'll only be able to reduce attacks since we're banishing Link monsters, but that's still pretty nice, and when you return them from the brink, you can place them in any of your available main monster zones to help set up your co-links. The trip may be temporary, but the debuff isn't. World Legacy Awakens might also be a fun include here, as it gives us access to our on-link summon effects during our opponent's turn, and could lead to an unexpected co-link that derails your opponent's plans. How about some useful World Legacies? World Crown might have been useful as a link laddering tool, but our Link 2s don't point into the main monster zones from the EMZ, so unless they end up in the main monster zone by some other method, Crown is going to be stuck in your hand. World Arc is pretty interesting though, because if any of your nightmares or other Link monsters get destroyed by our opponent's effects, World Arc can reborn it immediately. And while our monsters usually don't have the highest attack stat, we can easily rectify that with World Lance, which will reduce an opponent's monster's attack by 3000 for a battle involving a Link monster. Note that it doesn't care who owns the Link monster, just that one is involved. So you can even use this when going up against your opponent's Link monsters. Pretty snazzy. But what about some other cards that care about co-linking? After all, Nightmares have fun with it, but they aren't the only game in town. I, for one, have Trigate Wizard seared into my mind after several Extra Link formats. Its removal, negation, and a win condition all by itself if you can get the co-links going. You might not have as much success with it today, but even getting to the banishing spot removal is pretty good. Transcode Talker sees a lot of play in Cyburst decks, but the material is pretty generic, and the bonus works on anything co-linked to it. But G Golem Invalid Dolmen might be a better choice for its arrow placements. It does require Earth monsters as materials though, so its usability will depend on what the base deck is that you're running. But making your co-linked monsters unaffected by effect monsters your opponent controls is pretty sick. 
The Codebreaker engine is also a pretty slick way to get some free material for later summons, and just have some cool effects to boot. Security Dragon can be a neat piece of removal as you're link climbing, but the biggest payoff we have has got to be World Sea Dragon Zealantis. Its ability to shuffle around monsters isn't as strong as if we played it in Marincess, but it still serves its primary purpose all the same here, while giving you removal based on your co-links. Ain't that fun? A card from the lore that wouldn't work so well in the story, but is pretty nice mechanically, is Mech Knight Crusadia Avramax. Its two side arrows can fit right into the center monster zone as part of a co-linking chain, keeps all your other nightmares from being attacked, and benefits from all the continuous effects. And all you need is two of your Link 2s to make it happen, meaning Cerberus and Phoenix make for excellent material. As for a silly tech pick, look no further than Clock Wyvern. On summon, it makes a differently named token, which makes this a one-card Link 2 Nightmare. And if you get your hands on a fusion spell, you can access Cyber's Clock Dragon. Fuse together some of your links, and you can easily clear 8,000 attack on this and go for game. Or you can make it using minimal material, maybe even saving on some of the cost with Cynet Fusion if you've managed to get a Cyber's Link monster in Grave, at which point Clock Dragon can give some protection to all of your Link monsters, while floating into any spell you could ever want if your opponent destroys it by card effect. And that's all I have to say about Nightmares. I expect we'll be seeing these in extra decks for a long, long time, because barring any summoning restrictions like what you see in branded decks, these Link monsters provide an unparalleled level of utility to any deck that can comfortably field more than one monster. It's a toolbox so generic and useful that it even breaks established conventions on what decks can do. Though, since they share the same space with the negation engine known as Appaloosa and the OTK machine we call Access Code Talker, they aren't exactly unique in that regard. So, best of luck to anything in the future trying to fill those roles, because finding a way to power creep these cards is gonna be a nightmare. So what's the deal with Crusadia? Well, like the World Chalice theme before it, the archetype doesn't really adhere to a particular unifying stat line. Rather, the Link monsters have a unique property where they gain the original attack of everything they point to, though those monsters aren't able to attack, and the main deck monsters can be special summoned in defense position to any of your main monster zones a Link monster points to, while also providing some other benefit, usually in the form of combat bonuses that help you knock out your opponent in a single blow. Let's start with those main deck monsters. Crusadia Arborea is a level 3 water warrior tuner monster with 800 attack and 1800 defense, and if any number of Crusadia monsters you control would be destroyed by battle or card effect, you can banish this card from your field or grave instead. So while it's not buffing up your link monster directly, it does act as a shield for them in the future. Use Arborea to link climb, then when your opponent tries to lightning storm you on the crackback, you've got an insurance policy waiting in the wings. Heck, if your opponent has any quick effect destruction they want to use on your turn, you might not even have to wait that long. And since it protects any Crusadia, not just our links, it can even keep your early material safe in case your opponent tries to cut you off. And then, on top of everything else, it's also a tuner. So if you want to jam in some utility synchros, you're all clear. Namely, the level 6s and 7s, since our other monsters consist of levels 3 and 4. This may seem like the most innocuous of the crew, but if you overlook it, you'll be missing the Arborea for the trees. Crusadia Leonis is a level 3 Earth Beast monster with 1200 attack and 1600 defense, and once per turn you can target a Crusadia monster you control, giving it piercing battle damage if it attacks a monster this turn. So even if your opponent tries to turtle up, they won't be able to avoid a truckload of damage. It's funny though, out of all the things we're going to be using to up our damage, even as good as piercing can be, I still wouldn't call it our main way to win. Crusadia Reclusia is a level 3 fire spell caster monster with 400 attack and 2000 defense, and if this card is normal or special summoned to a zone a link monster points to, you can target a Crusadia card you control and a card your opponent controls and destroy them. This gives us a way to deal with cards in a way that, stick with me here, does not involve battle. I know, I know, big shocker, but until we can start playing God's format, we can't punch spells and traps. So Reclusia is our main deck answer to anything that tries to engage with us in a way that isn't fair combat. Truly, in an archetype full of jocks, Reclusia is the nerd that helps keep things going. 
Crusadia Draco is a level 4 wind dragon monster with 600 attack and 2000 defense, and if this card is normal or special summoned to a zonal link monster points to, you can target a Crusadia card in your grave, except this card, and add it to your hand. This is actually an integral piece of the deck for helping you reach your full potential. See, earlier on in our combos, we're gonna need to use our normal summon to get a Crusadia onto the board since, you know, no links. But one of those links searches us a monster, guaranteeing that we can search and then special summon Draco, which can then put the normal summoned Crusadia back in our hand, allowing us to use its special summon effect to link climb even higher. And once you've accomplished that, future Dracos can get you whatever card you want from your grave in the future, especially because this can get cards, not just monsters. Just another example of why dragons are a man's best friend. You know, because it plays fetch. Crusadia Maximus is a level 4 light psychic monster with 1600 attack and 1000 defense, and once per turn it can target a Crusadia link monster you control, and that turn, if it battles an opponent's monster, any battle damage it inflicts to your opponent is doubled, but other monsters you control can't attack that turn. Something you won't generally have to worry about since you'll be stopping your monsters from attacking anyway, but helps to keep you from cheesing all the same, which I have mixed feelings about. Not only does this make for excellent rank 4 material if you need it, this effectively doubles the bonus attack your links will get, making it that much easier to close out games. In fact, you could say that it maximizes their potential. Alright, that's all of our main deck monsters, now it's time for those links. Crusadia Magius is a Link 1 light spellcaster monster with 100 attack, requiring any Crusadia monster as material, except a copy of itself. And if an effect monster is special summoned to the zone this card points to, except during the damage step, you can add a Crusadia monster from your deck to your hand. So remember that Draco combo I told you about a couple paragraphs ago? Magius is the Link that does that for you. So as long as you have a monster in hand that can be special summoned to Magius' zone, you're basically guaranteed to get into a Link 4, which is fan Fantastic. It's almost as fantastic as that hat. Look at it! The luxurious red, the glorious golden highlights. Mage just truly is a thing of beauty. Crusadia Regulex is a Link 2 light beast monster with a thousand attack, requiring two effect monsters, including a Crusadia monster, as material. And if any number of effect monsters are special summoned to zones this card points to, except during the damage step, you can add a Crusadia Speller Trap card from your deck to your hand. Yup, this checks for any zone. So this does kind of put your opponent in a Salomon Great Sunlight Wolf kind of situation, which you can easily force with a Kaiju. This can get you into a ton of different effects, from protection to even more damage amplification, all before going into the deck's big boss monster. I'm not quite sure why the big fire line is the one getting our spell and trap card, instead of, you know, the spellcaster, but maybe I'm just typecasting here. Maybe Regulex practices hexes on the weekend. Crusadia Spatha is a Link 2 light warrior monster with 500 attack, also requiring two effect monsters, including a Crusadia monster, as material. And if an effect monster is special summoned to a zone this card points to, except during the damage step, you can target a monster in either player's main monster zone, except this card, and move it to another main monster zone on its controller's field. Now, this is meant to do some very funny things. One of the more infamous applications was its use in Dragon Link decks of all things. Because Draco is a dragon, it fit right into the theme, giving it access to Spatha since the materials are so lenient. Then, if you Link summoned any of the Link 1 guard dragons under Spatha, you could move it a space over, and now you had a zone with two Link monsters pointing to it. But how does it help Crusadia? Well, while you have to summon to Spatha's zone to activate it, you can move any monster on the field. And, since our boss monster has a forward pointing Link arrow, you can move an opponent's monster to the zone right above the extra monster zone you plan to summon it to. And now you can cause some real problems for your opponent. So it's a surprisingly strong Link monster, but we have got to talk about the wardrobe here. I know there isn't like a unifying aesthetic for the Crusadias, but Spatha looks like Devotee of Nephthys. Great shade of blue, not so great for team building. Crusadia Equimax is a Link 3 light cybers monster with 2000 attack, requiring two or more effect monsters, including a Link monster, as material. And once per turn as a quick effect, you contribute a Crusadia or World Legacy monster this card points to, then target a face-up card your opponent controls and negate its effects until the end of this turn. Now, it does bite to lose all the attack power from the monster you tribute, but for that you get what amounts to an Omni-Negate for a face-up card on the field, and it bypasses chain blocking, so really, it's kind of a bargain. But don't try doing anything cheeky like tributing your opponent's Crusadia or World Legacy monster this points to, because it does so for cost, and nothing about the card lets 
lets you bypass the rules like Layer of Darkness does. But the Layer of Darkness cards don't let you punch in with a gigantic Link monster for game, so really, it all equal maxes out. Now, that's who I would call the deck's main boss monster, since it follows most of the deck's conventions, but we've also got one more that we've covered in a past video. Mech Knight Crusadia Avramax is a Link 4 light cybers monster with 3000 attack, requiring two or more monsters special summoned from the extra deck as material. While this Link Summoned card is on the field, your opponent can't target this card with card effects, also their monsters can't target monsters for attacks, except this one. Once per battle during damage calculation, if this card battles a special summoned monster as a quick effect, you can make this card gain attack equal to that opponent's monster's attack during that damage calculation only. If this Link Summoned card you control is sent to the grave by an opponent's card, you can shuffle a card on the field into the deck. So it doesn't have the effect where it takes the attack of what it points to, but the fact that it has its own built-in Honest does kind of make up for it. And it can still benefit from all the bonuses we've talked about so far since it is a Crusadia Link monster. Leonis' is Piercing, Maximus' is Double Damage, and even some things we haven't even talked about coming from our spells and traps. That's all I've got for this section. Normally I end with a joke, but you're gonna have to watch the Mech Knight video for that one. Uh, moving on. Alright, that's all of our monsters, now it's time for the spells and traps. Crusadia Power is a quick play spell card that targets a Crusadia monster you control, and that Crusadia monster is unaffected by card effects this turn, except its own. So if your opponent threatens your big dingus, you can just flip power and now it's fine. No Imperm, no Lightning Storm, no Arise Heart, no Mirror Jade, no Kaleido Heart, you basically have a free turn to do whatever you want, as long as you ignore that Kaijus exist and power through them. Crusadia Testament is a quick play spell card that has one of two effects. Either it keeps your opponent from activating cards or effects in response to the activation of your Crusadia monster effects this turn, or, after damage calculation, if your Crusadia Link monster destroys an opponent's monster by battle, you draw cards equal to your monster's Link rating. So you either get to magical meltdown your entire combo line, or you just draw a fresh new hand of cards. Get Avermax to run something over, and that's a draw 4. Now, I could talk about the applications of the other effect, but when I said draw four, you already pulled up Master Duel to lab this out. Probably should have waited until the end of the video to talk about this. Crusadia Revival is a field spell card that gives all Crusadia Link monsters on the field 500 attack, and once per turn, you can target a Crusadia Link monster you control, and this turn, even if this card leaves the field, it can attack all monsters your opponent controls once each. Also, other monsters you control can't attack. This is the last of our battle modifiers, and it is a doozy. Being able to hit everything isn't just a battle board wipe, it's basically an OTK. Combine this with damage doubling and piercing, and it's basically like playing Numeron without the stigma. And then you just get a 500 attack boost on top of it just cuz. But it is also a little misleading. It's a good thing my videos exist, otherwise you might have thought this was some kind of monster reborn. Crusadia Crawler is a continuous trap card that, when activated, special summons this card as an effect monster that's a level 2 earth insect with 300 attack and 2100 defense that is also still treated as a trap card. If this card is special summoned by this effect to a zone a link monster points to, you can add a world legacy card from your deck to your hand. Now, this is a crawler card, but it's much better for us here. While the insects do have links and they do get some pretty useful world legacy cards, we can search this with Regulus, then when activated it'll give us another card on summon, and then can be used to fuel Equimax's negate. It's strange though, even if the name checks two different archetypes, I almost feel like it should be in a third. Like, it's a bug that looks digital, does that remind anyone of anything? Crusadia Vanguard is a continuous trap card, and when you activate this card, you can also tribute a Crusadia or World Legacy monster, and if you do, special summon a Crusadia or World Legacy monster with a different original name from your deck or grave. And while you control a Crusadia Link monster, your opponent's monsters can only target Link monsters for attacks, which kind of ends up getting represented in Avermax's effect, which I think is pretty neat. But its on activation effect is what's really important. You can swap out a Crusadia for a different one, triggering any applicable effects. One of my favorites is summoning Reclusia, then using its on summon effect to pop an opponent's card while only losing the Vanguard. That way you can keep the monster as material for later. And, you know, you don't want to keep a competing card game on the board for long, that's just bad business. Alright, now it's time for a little combo. This will get you right into Avermax with only two Crusadias of different names in your hand. First off, Normal Summon a non-Draco Crusadia, link it into Magius, 
then special summon the other Crusadia from your hand. Use Magius to get Draco if you don't already have one, and if you do already have it, any Crusadia you haven't special summoned yet will do. Link into Regulex, then special summon Draco. This will get you both a Speller Trap card from your deck, chain blocked by Draco getting back the Crusadia you normal summon. Now you can link into Equimax, and with that special summon you just got back, you can link that monster into Magius to make sure all your monsters were special summoned from the extra deck, then link all of that into Avermax. That's all off of two cards, and that didn't even cover the Speller Trap you get off of Regulex. If you're going first, you can grab Power to make super sure Avermax survives that turn, or you can get Testament for the big draw 4 if you can attack. Alright, so that's all the Crusadia cards, but what do we do with them? Well, we're not exactly interested in letting our opponent take their time and build up their resources, we want to trample them underfoot as soon as possible. So we're going to want to include as many cards that facilitate that, while keeping our opponent on the back foot. So what can we play to help them out? Well, a classic support card, not just for this deck, but in the tech picks of many videos I've made, are Kaijus. Spatha does an excellent job of moving our opponent's monsters to the right locations, but with our big big creatures, we can transmogrify a monster that's tough to deal with, and get them in the right position all at once. Put it in front of Equimax, and not only will it not be able to attack, if it somehow survives that long, you'll have all the attack you could ever want. Heck, if you have two Kaijus, you can summon one of them to one of your zones that Equimax points to to get even more attack power. Parallel Exceed is another phenomenal piece of support we can use. Link summon anything and you get two free monsters that will end up triggering Magius and Regulex's effect to search. Bonus, you can use them to make Update Jammer, which isn't just another attribute for Access Code Talker's destruction effect, it gives you another way to OTK by giving Access Code two attacks. I know there's a bit of discourse about that right now, but um, I think it's based. Alternatively, while it is printed as a level 8 monster, they become level 4, making them excellent material to make rank 4s, giving you access to Abyss Dweller or Baguska, both of which are very helpful in a variety of matchups. As per usual, we've got to talk about our World Legacy cards and see which ones work best with us. As for our big machines, World Crown is basically an honorary Crusadia. It can be special summoned from the hand, just like one to a link point, and if the effect of a monster special summoned from the extra deck is activated, you contribute this card to negate the activation, and if you do, destroy it. It's got another effect, but it's not really important. Besides, World Armor does that job even better, getting you any World Legacy card on summon. And because of Vanguard, it's actually pretty easy easy to summon it, and is necessary if you want to utilize Lib, the World Key Blade Master. World Lance is also pretty funny, because if Equimax attacks what it's pointing to, then uses this to drop that opponent's monster to zero attack, you won't lose any attack, because Equimax only pulls from the pointed monster's original attack. Very funny. As for the spells and traps, most of them are better with other themes than with us. Succession is, of course, good in any Link deck, especially since you can search it out with Lib, and does a good job of triggering our Crusadia effects on follow-up turns. And if we are playing those gigantic World Legacy monsters, Collapse is actually pretty nifty here. It can give your Link monsters a huge boost, uh, a boost that doesn't go away at end of turn, I might add, and then it basically gives your Cybers Crusadias floating, which is heckin' cool. Now, while we've been given a lot of material to work with, we don't actually get locked into any archetype in particular. So, if you need some removal where raw attack power just won't cut it, like I mentioned earlier, Access Code Talker is a great option. Even without Update Jammer, you can do the classic using a Link 3 as material through Equimax, and still get some pops. IP Masquerina also makes for an excellent alternate Link 2 on your way up the Link ladder, because Equimax only requires a Link monster for its specific material. So if you don't need the Spell and Trap search from Regulus, then Equimax will have one last thing to worry about. As for a silly tech pick, how about Run and Rescue Cat? Leonis is, in fact, a beast monster, so it's a valid target, but what's the other one gonna be? Elephant the Elephant, of course! That's a tuner and a non-tuner that add up to level 5, both of which being Earth, and that means you get Naturia Beast! Heck, if you have another Crusadia in hand, you don't even have to divert from your normal combo line. You normal summon Rescue Cat, and then get Leo and Elephant. Then use Leo to start your Link Climb as normal. Just make sure you use Draco to get back Leo, so you can special summon it again to sink for Beast, and that still gets you up to Equimax, with an optional Avermax if you have an additional Crusadia name in hand to special summon. 
And that's all I have to say about Crusadia. As far as OTK decks go, this is one of the coolest. While it has a clearly linear line of play to just wallop the opponent, it's actually got some flexibility to deliver a fair share of solutions to a number of the game's problems, which isn't really a trait that most OTK decks have. They're rough, they're tough, and they don't need to bluff, because if you give them any wiggle room, they're gonna snuff you out. Oh no, shoot, they'll crucify you, that's way better. So what's the deal with Orcist? Well, they're a series of dark attribute machine type monsters. They're characterized by two facets. A majority of our main deck monsters banish themselves for some kind of effect, generally to summon an Orcist from a variety of different zones, while our Link monsters shuffle banished machines back into our deck to provide a number of utility effects, with an emphasis on monsters that are linked. As a reminder, a monster is linked if it points to a monster with its link arrows, or is being pointed to by a monster's link arrows. And while not as strict as co-linking, it is interesting that this follow-up evil archetype has a similar mechanic to nightmares. I love little lore nods like that. But before we get into those, let's cover the foundational members of the theme, the main deck monsters, and we can actually cover the first three fairly quickly, as they're quite similar. Orcist Brass Bombard is a level 1 tuner monster with 500 attack and 1900 defense. Orcist Symbol Skeleton is a level 3 monster with 1200 attack and 1500 defense. And Orcist Harp Horror is a level 4 monster with 1700 attack and 1400 defense. Each one of them can be banished from the grave to summon an Orcus from a particular zone. Brass Bombard summons from the hand, Symbol Skeleton is a targeted graveyard revival, and Harp Horror summons right out of the deck. But no matter what, it locks you out of special summoning monsters for the rest of the turn except Dark Monsters, which, if you've played Yu-Gi-Oh! for any extensive period of time, will sound like the flimsiest slap on the wrist restriction ever made, because as it turns out, Dark Monsters have historically been pretty good. These three form the core of your deck, with Harp Horror able to pull other Orcists right out of your deck as needed, letting you link them away for your big bosses, at which point you can use cards like Symbol Skeleton to revive those bosses, and Brass Bombard, uh, just kinda hangs out, it wasn't actually largely used. Despite the fact that, like Shadals, the random tuner gives the deck access to synchros, but whatever. Unfortunately, the deck is a few strings short of an instrument, since Harp Horror is currently banned on the TCG Forbidden and Limited list, taking out a lot of the deck's power. The good news is that this is 3 in every other format I can think of, including recently in Master Duel. So if you don't mind your cards being made of 1s and zeros, you can slot this bad boy back where it belongs so the band can play on. Girsu, the Orcist Mech Knight, is a level 4 monster with 1800 attack and 0 defense, and if this card is normal or special summoned, you can send an Orcist or World Legacy card from your deck to the grave. Then, if two or more other cards are in this card's column, treat this card as a tuner this turn. If you control no other monsters, you can special summon a World Legacy token to both players' fields and defense position, which is a level 1 Dark Machine monster with 0 attack and defense. A bit of a latecomer to the theme, Orcist Girsu partially fills the role that Harp left behind by foolishing any on-theme monster right into the grave. The tuner effect condition comes in from the Mech Knight half of the card, though in most regards you won't be using this in an Orcus deck. As we've seen before, people weren't exactly slotting in synchros just to facilitate Brass Bombard. But the token summoning effect really pushes Girsu over the top by giving you access to your Link 2 pool all by itself, while locking out a number of cards that require your opponent to have an open board. Think your Imperms, think your Fenrirs, all that stuff. And with the repeatability of Orcist, it's only a matter of time before you can do this again and again to make an even more stacked graveyard. The DCG might be a bit aimless without our Gilded Gargoyle, but now we have a new monster that makes up the main thrust of our strategy. Orcus Nightmare is a level 7 monster with 100 attack and 2000 defense, and can't be destroyed by battle with a Link monster. You can banish this card from your grave, then target a monster on the field. The Dark Summon Lock is applied like our core Orcists, and you also send a Dark Machine monster from your deck to the grave, except a copy of itself, and if you do, the targeted monster gains attack equal to the level of the monster sent times 100 until the end of the turn. So we covered this card back in Nightmare Explained, and we kind of glazed over it because it doesn't really do anything for them. And that's because its status as a nightmare monster was really more of a bonus effect tacked onto this monster, rather than being a fully fledged member of that team. In Orcist, it was pivotal, with deck builders brewing and scheming until they could find the fastest way to throw two monsters onto the board, make a Link 2 Nightmare, link it in a mermaid, then summon this out of the deck, giving you access to the Orcist Link 2, and you are off to the races from there. 
But it doesn't just end there, because while in the grave, not only is it another foolish burial for our Orcists, it's a foolish burial for any dark machine. And we've got some really choice targets. And the bigger the monster, the bigger the bonus. Not only giving your own monsters a boost, but could potentially boost an opponent's monster if messing with their stats will help you in some way. Or even if you don't have any targets on your side of the field, if you're that desperate for the foolish. But this hasn't made the messed up fractal splintering any easier to digest though, I swear, you could put this next to an SCP and it wouldn't feel out of place. World Legacy World Wand is a level 8 monster with 500 attack and 2500 defense, and this normal summoned or set card can be destroyed by battle with a monster special summon from the extra deck. If this card is sent to the grave, you can special summon a World Legacy monster from your hand, and you can banish this card from your grave, then target a banished Orcus monster and special summon it, putting you under the dark summoning lock. See? We got that Orcus connection somewhere. This is an especially outstanding card because it adds another link to the resource chain of the deck. While we can recover banished Orcus no problem, summoning them back to the field directly means that they're ready for action that much sooner. And if, for some reason, you're playing other world legacies, its effect when sent to the grave gets them out of your hand. And all of that wrapped up in an ancient techno artifact orbiting the earth. Now that's a card that's out of this world. Alright, that does it for the main deck monsters, now it's time for the extra deck ones, starting with our links. Galatea, the Orcist Automaton, is a Link 2 monster with 1800 attack, requiring any two effect monsters, including an Orcist monster. This linked card can't be destroyed by battle, and you can target one of your banished machine monsters and shuffle it into the deck. Then you can set an Orcist spell or trap directly from your deck. That's right, you get one of your monsters back into rotation while getting a fantastic piece of support ready to go, all on a decently sized monster that, with careful zone placement, can't even be destroyed by battle. And since you're more than likely going to banish at least one Orcus to make this, you'll have fuel all ready to go right from the start. You'll also notice that getting the Speller Trap card isn't mandatory. If you want, you can just shuffle a banished machine into your deck and do nothing else with it if you've run out of targets. Now, say what you will about what Ningirsu has done here. Me, I'm not one to judge. But there is something about the design that has me completely baffled. Why, in the wide world of sports, with all of Ningirsu's technological know-how, did he give Galatea the Fire Emblem Awakening feat? You've got this machine swinging around a giant scythe while they have peg legs! You need to fix that! Longirsu, the Orcist Orchestrator, is a Link 3 monster with 2500 attack, requiring two or more effect monsters, including an Orcist monster, as material. This linked card can't be destroyed by card effects, and it can target two of your banished machine monsters and shuffle them into the deck, then you can send a linked monster your opponent controls to the grave. But this card can't attack the turn you activate this effect. While Galatea sets up your game plan, Longirsu is here to mess up your opponents, with one of the most effective methods of removal so far, non-targeted sending. While linking might seem that it implies targeting, it really just lets you send a monster that meets that criteria. It doesn't even have to be linked to Long Girsu, so if your opponent has independently linked their own monsters, they are not safe. And with this monster on the field, they won't be there for long. Girsu. Or Custrian is a Link 4 monster with 3000 attack, requiring two or more effect monsters, including an Orcist monster, as material. This linked card can't be destroyed by battle or card effect, and it can target three of your banished machine monsters, shuffle them into the deck, and if you do, the attack and defense of any linked monster your opponent currently controls becomes zero. Also, their effects are negated. And that's permanent, by the way. Any affected monster is basically just fodder at that point. It's an impressive finisher, but not necessarily an effective one. While you get to recycle a lot of monsters with this, your banished pool is almost as much of a resource in and of itself, giving you fuel for the effects of Galatea and Long Girsu, so you might not always have enough to spare. So, despite some impressive pipes, I am going to have to file a noise complaint. Dingirsu, the Orcist of the Evening Star, is a rank 8 Xyz monster with 2600 attack and 2100 defense, requiring any two level 8 monsters as material. And you can only special summon copies of Dingirsu once per turn. And you can also Xyz summon this card by using any Orcist Link monster you control as material. If any number of cards you control would be destroyed by a battle or card effect, you can attach a material instead to save all of those cards. And if this card is special summoned, you can activate one of these effects. Either send a card your opponent controls to the grave, or attach one of your banished machine monsters to this card as material. Now this is a sleeper hit, and really helped Orcus come into its own. By converting any of your resource engines into this, you get your choice of non-targeting sending removal, or adding another shield to it. 
keeping itself and your card safe. Whether you were deflecting opponent's interactions or cheesing instant fusion to keep Winda on board. And because it triggers on special summon, not Xyz summon, you can bring this back with Simple Skeleton or World Wand and get the effect again. This is a fantastic card, both in Orcist and as part of any rank 8 toolbox, and is easily the evening star of the show. Alright, that's all of our monsters covered, now it's time for the spells and traps. Orchestrated Return is a normal spell card that sends an Orchist or World Legacy monster from your hand or face-up field to the grave to draw two cards. Here it is, folks, our archetypal draw two spell, and this one is an outstanding example. While not all of the World Legacy monsters are quite as helpful in the grave, our Orchists love being there. So with this, we've effectively cycled through two cards and set up a third, all without having to commit any other resources. There really isn't much else to say about this mechanically, a 10 out of 10 card, would totally take another dip in the Bakta tank. Orchestrated Einsatz is a continuous spell card, and if your opponent normal or special summons any number of monsters, except during the damage step, you can take an Orchest or World Legacy monster from your hand or deck, and either send it to the grave or banish it. Now the banishing part might seem strange, because our effects activate in the grave to then banish them, but remember, we've got to get fuel for our links somehow. So if you've already made use of a particular Orchest's effect, you can instead just banish it straight away, so long Girsu has all the parts they need to show a monster a bad time. Or, alternatively, you can just load up your grave with another useful Orchist and or World Legacy, that's totally valid. Really, the big issue here is you're gonna have to check to see if you have Renter's Insurance. And if so, if it covers cosmic light beams lifting your ocean-based orbital elevator out of the sea. They can be pretty stingy about stuff like that, believe me. In fact, let's turn back the clock a bit and take a look at this before it got turned into the world's most avant-garde Christmas tree. Orchestrated Babel is a field spell card that allows you to activate the effects of Orchist monsters in the grave, or link monsters you control with Orchist in their original names, as quick effects. And during your main phase, if this card is in your grave except the turn it was sent to the grave, you can send a card from your hand to the grave to add this card to your hand. That's right, we have a spell speed modifier on our hands, and I'm not gonna lie, it was so hard keeping this under my hat until we got here. This is probably the coolest card in the entire theme, and honestly, it barely does anything. But what it does do is amazing. Remember all the stuff we talked about in the monster section? Imagine if that was a quick effect. Then you might be able to see why this is so bonkers. With this live, Galatea is setting you an Orchist Speller Trap every turn even your opponents. Longirsu is non-targeting, sending monsters to grave during your opponent's turn as well. Symbol Skeleton can summon Dingirsu at quick effect speed to snipe a card. Orchestrated Nightmare can be banished from the grave to get a quick attack boost at a moment's notice. And I'm sure there's so many other things I haven't even thought of. And unless you're packing a Cosmic Cyclone, this card's gonna come back turn after turn to keep this up, even acting as a kind of discard outlet to enable any grave effects. You know, like from Orchists. While there are other effects that work like this, I don't feel like any of them have been quite so catastrophically powerful as this example. No wonder God wanted this thing taken down. Quick, how do we get all the Orchist players to all understand different card games so they can't communicate with each other? Orchestrated Attack is a normal trap card that can be activated when an attack is declared by a monster. Tribute an Orchist or World Legacy monster, then target a monster your opponent controls and banish it. Since the trigger is on any attack, it doesn't actually have to be from your opponent, nor does it have to be the monster involved in the battle. And because you can set this with Galatea during your opponent's turn, it's actually more proactive than you might think. It won't bypass targeting protection like our other pieces of removal, but banishing can shut off an entirely different vector of gameplay and it's certainly showing its effectiveness. Look, Longirsu even has the high ground. Nothing bad ever happens when you have the high ground. Orchestrated Release is a normal trap card that tributes two machine monsters, then targets a monster in your grave and special summons it. And if your opponent controls a link monster, you can target two instead. This is a pretty underwhelming card, not gonna lie. It's a three for one that becomes a three for two if your opponent has a link monster, which with the advent of Master Rule Revision 4 isn't as guaranteed as it once was. Granted, it gets you back any monster, but at that point, just play back to the front. Play Call of the Haunted, play literally anything else. It might put Orcus in your grave, it might put machines in general into your grave, but we have better ways to fast track those cards into the grave, Longirsu. That's not him in there! Lee's coming back! Longirsu! Don't hand over the body, Longirsu! 
Orchest Crescendo is a counter trap card, and when a spell card, trap card, or monster effect is activated while you control an Orchest Link monster, negate the activation, and if you do, banish that card. And you can banish this card from your grave to add to your hand one of your Dark Machine monsters that are either banished or are in your deck, but you're locked not just into special summoning darks, but Dark Machines for the whole turn, including before this effect was activated. And these two effects are mutually exclusive, so you can't activate this to negate a card, then immediately get a search. This card is phenomenal, it's hard to codify just how good it really is. It's searchable by Galatea, who just by being on the field makes this card live, and nabs you a free Orcist on a turn you don't expect to be activating another copy of this. Or, as the card says, any dark machine if you've got any funny ones splashed in. And it banishes what it negates too, so whatever you're getting rid of, it ain't coming back. Just goes to show that no matter what period of time it is, Sophia will always get bodied by a little gremlin that's a fraction of their size. See, it's like poetry. It rhymes. Orchestrated Core is a continuous trap card, and once per turn, you can banish a monster from your field or grave, then target an Orchest or World Legacy card you control, except this card. Neither player can target it with card effects this turn, even if this card leaves the field. And if any number of other Orchest and or World Legacy cards you control would be destroyed by a battle or card effect, you can send this card to the grave instead. So the cost can be paid by banishing any monster, and it keeps any on the theme cards safe from targeting for the rest of the turn, which is nice. Unless the kind of interaction you're trying to protect against is chainable. Now, if that interaction is destruction, Core can be sent to the grave to cover for that too, but everything else? You're out of luck. It really just does too little to be considered for serious play. And honestly, I think that's for the better. I don't know if I would have liked to see the moment before Galatea got turned into a pancake by World Wand hitting the planet's surface at terminal velocity. That would not be pretty. So that's all the Orcist cards, but what do we do with them? Well, with all the value cards we have access to, our main game plan is to establish a loop as soon as possible, and make sure it stays that way. Our main engine has plenty of disruption and negation, so we'll be looking to leverage the larger link pool for offensive plays, as well as other cards that can turbo our deck into our grave. So what can we play to help them out? Let's talk about some graveyard fillers. Foolish Burial is our obvious go-to choice to yard whichever Orcist we need. While Harpoor isn't around to help in the TCG, you can circumvent this by sending Nightmare, banishing it to boost anything, sending World Wand to Grave, then banishing it to get Nightmare on board. We sadly can't go into Mermaid to get a second Nightmare and go into Galatea, but any normal summonable effect monster gets us there. Foolish Burial Goods is also good for setting up Babel. While you could use Terraforming, that just puts it into your hand goods it into your graveyard, and that's a discard outlet. Eventually. And if the TCG ever goes the way of Master Duel and just bans terraforming, this is a good one to keep in mind. As usual, let's take a look at the World Legacy listing of cards to see if there's any Orchist support hiding in there, like with the previous archetypes in the story. Something you'll notice about all of the World Legacy monsters is that they are also Dark Machines, meaning that they fit in with a lot of our support. However, from that point, the connections start to go cold. World Crown can be used like in Crusadia to help with link climbing, and can still provide its summon negation. World Armor can be summoned out of your hand with the effect of World Wand to nab you not just a giant monster, but also a World Legacy card. World Lance remains as a very powerful hand trap for our link monsters. But probably the one that works closest with us is World Arc. If our links ever manage to get destroyed, we can bring them back with Arc's in-hand effect. And if we're able to stick this onto the board with a normal summon, this does become a foolish burial anytime our opponent special summons from the extra deck. Lib, the World Key Blade Master, remains as one of the best extenders we could hope for. By using Girsu, we can send a World Legacy monster to the grave, make a token, and then link into Lib at which point we can access World Legacy Succession as a revival tool, before continuing up the Link ladder to spin another card. Speaking of World Legacy spells and traps, there aren't very many that actually support Orcist. This is one of the first themes where their support is actually in their own archetype. Many of them run the gamut between not even being close to usable, to being incidentally useful, with World Legacy's memory probably being one of the closest. However, it only summons Girsu, and you're gonna want to make sure you only use it during the end of a turn so it doesn't get in the way of your special summons. The cool news though is that, because it puts Girsu back in your hand, you can essentially double dip on the Foolish Burial effect. Since Nightmare and Crescendo both work with Dark Machines in general, what are some good ones we can splash in? If there's a light matchup we want to extremely hose, use Crescendo to get Ally of Justice Quarantine. And you can do something similar with archetypes that send cards from the deck to the grave with Dimension Fortress Weapon. 
Gizmek Orochi is a popular option, as it's a free big monster you can summon from the grave, provides a huge boost off of being sent to the grave with Nightmare, can provide removal itself, and in rare circumstances, can even help you make Dingirsu the normal way. Jinzo can make an appearance to help deal with Labyrinth decks, Gen X ally Birdman just recently got unlimited, opening up a whole host of options, and BM4 Blast Spider doesn't have a lot of synergy with us, since our removal sends to the grave and not destroys, but if we run over other things in battle, that burn damage will still trigger. Shame that Heavy Metal Raiders is a field spell and conflicts with Babel, otherwise that would be pretty funky. Another great way to vent some machines into our grave is with Scrap Recycler. While we're not going to be using the second effect for much, setting up our entire theme off a single normal summon seems pretty good. You can even play more than three copies of it if you go down the Scrap Raptor route, which can pop itself for an extra normal summon, which will in turn search you Scrap Raptor to use that normal summon on. And once you add things like Fossil Dig and Scrapyard into the mix, it just gets absurd. <laughs> And at that point, you can add in the Scrap Wyvern and Golem lines, and if I keep going down this route, I'm going to have to pay royalties to have Ricard Man for appropriating his Chop Shop list. As for Dark Monsters in general, a very convenient line of Link monsters that all have that attribute are IP Mascarena, helpful for if you want to go into non-darks by waiting until your opponent's turn, Nightmare Unicorn, which IP can spring on your opponent and is one heck of a removal tool, and Access Code Talker because of course we have access to the code. While we may not have a diverse pool of Link monsters to get multiple pops in a single turn, even just one can mean the difference between a game being over or not. One of the big issues while playing graveyard decks like this is that you're susceptible to banishing effects. And while Babel makes us all but immune to the overreaching called by the grave, getting hit by Dimension Shifter is a bit harder to deal with. You might be able to use your own called by the grave against it, but since it's a one of, you can't really rely on it. So you may have to focus on being a bit trickier, and that's where Chaos Hunter comes in. From activated to continuous to applied effects, as long as it's your opponent's card that causes banishing, Chaos Hunter turns it off, keeping your grave secured. It also comes with that discard which can actually help your plans in certain scenarios. The downside is that your opponent needs to perform a special summon to get this onto the board quickly, and against D Shifter's strongest client Fluanderees, that's basically a blank tech, so keep an eye on your meta to see how it'll do. Especially because turning off Banishing can have a wealth of benefits against a number of decks. As for a silly tech pick, well, a deck that this might have a good home in is Ishizu Tier. Sure, most of the deck has been gutted, but when it comes to filling up the space the ban list left behind, you could do worse. Most Orcists you tip over with Murley, Agito, and Kelbeck all get you value, and sending Orcists with Sheeran ain't too bad either. And because you're going to be playing King of the Swamp to mimic Kick Kalos, it can also be used to mimic Cyber Dragon for Chimera Tech Over Dragon, using any Orcus left in your grave as material, giving you a surprise finisher. Or, if you don't want to play tier limits in your deck and would rather just play original Cyber Dragon, then you could make use of the newly revealed Over Future Fusion. Both effects can be activated in the same turn, so you can send a Cyber Dragon right to the grave, then use all of your Dark Machines in Grave to make Chimera Tech Over Dragon. Just uh, make sure you only use this as a finisher, since not even the protection of the Gearsus can stop your cards from being sent to the grave. And that's all I have to say about Orcist. Sadly, they won't see a resurgence in paper until Harp Horror comes back. But with Konami's penchant for removing some silly cards from the list as of late, I don't think we're far off from seeing Orcist back at full operating capacity. So make sure to keep your instruments tuned and your skills sharp, because you never know when it's going to be time to strike up the band and strike down your opponent. So what's the deal with Gar Dragons? Well, they're a series of dragon monsters, which might seem obvious, but you can't take that for granted. Like most decks in the Vrain's era, the main goal is to facilitate Link summons, this time by incorporating normal monsters and dragon flavoring into the mix, with the Link monsters focusing on mobilizing more powerful dragons to close out the game. Though there is an additional mini-game surrounding them, requiring you to be very precise about your zone placements, which we'll get more into once we cover those monsters. First, let's talk about those main deck ones, starting with Guard Dragon Justicia, a level 2 water normal tuner monster with 0 attack and 2100 defense. Its flavor text reads, The fate of the world depends on the Guard Dragons, born from the world legacy. Wow, some actual thematic flavor text, who would have thought? This might have been our go-to option for a normal monster since it's on theme, but the funny thing about Guard Dragons is that none of their effects actually check for the name Guard Dragon. They either work with normals, 
dragons, or normal dragons. So you could swap this out with Galaxy Serpent and very few people would notice the difference. Though in its defense, it does have a whopper of a defense stat. So maybe run one or two. You know, justician case. All right, time for the effect monsters. Guard Dragon Promenesis is a level one fire monster with 500 attack and 200 defense. And you can send this card from your hand or field to the grave, then target a dragon monster you control. And it gains 500 attack and defense until the end of your opponent's turn. And if any number of normal monsters are sent to your grave while this card is in the grave, except during the damage step, you can special summon this card, but banish it when it leaves the field. So this is worse Salomon Great Spinny, right? I mean, look at them. They both have an in-hand effect that boosts a monster's attack, but is primarily to set up its grave summoning effect. Okay, yeah, you can send Promenesis from the field to the grave, but what's the point of that? Heck, you can't even do that if you revive it with its own effect because it doesn't tribute itself, it has to be sent to the grave, which, you know, it won't be. But for the theme itself, it does make for a nice extender, since you can normal Justitia, use Promenesis to boost it before linking Water Dragon away for a Link 1, which will then trigger Prom, getting you some more free material. And notably, it doesn't care how the normal monster ends up in the grave, or what type it is. So you can send it to the grave with Dragon Shrine for all it cares. If it was a tuner itself, I could see it having a load of utility in a number of decks. But without that special property, Promenesis isn't going to be very prominent. World Chalice Guard Dragon is a level 1 wind monster with 400 attack and defense, and when a card or effect is activated that targets your linked monster as a quick effect, you can send this card from your hand or field to the grave to negate the activation, and if you do, destroy that card. You can also banish this card from your grave, then target a normal monster in your grave and special summon it in defense position to your zone a link monster points to. Aw, we haven't seen this guy in a while. Originally showing up in World Chalice Explained, this little goober is great for summoning out fresh material for your link climbing while protecting said monsters, a perfect addition to a deck full of normal monsters. In this deck, we have a few less vanillas, but our monsters are still going to end up being linked very often, so we'll be making a lot of use out of its in-hand effect. And while we do have less targets for its revival effect, all we need is a single target for it. So once Justitia, or the normal dragon of your choice, hits the grave of any level, then you have some free material to work with. And no, my stance has not changed. This is still a very precious little guy. It's just... You never realize how quick they're going to grow up until it happens. Guard Dragon Garmides is a level 3 earth monster with 1600 attack and 1000 defense, and if any number of normal monsters are sent to your grave except during the damage step, you can special summon this card from your hand. And if this card is in your grave, you can send a dragon monster from your hand to the grave to add this card to your hand. Hey, a free summon from hand whenever you fulfill that vanilla's going to grave condition, that's nice. And the recovery effect actually works really well with Promenesis, especially if it has no targets for its effect, cause for that little unit, all that matters is that it ends up in the grave. And because it never gets banished that way, as long as you have dragons to discard, you can keep doing this over and over again to recycle Garmides. Heck, if you can get one in hand and one in grave, discarding a normal dragon will recover the Garm in grave while summoning the one that was already in your hand. And once that summoned one goes to the graveyard for whatever reason, you now have two Garms in the exact same place, giving you a bit of a resource loop. It's not exactly a highly valuable move, but hey, no Garm, no foul. Guard Dragon Andrake is a level 4 wind monster with 2000 attack and 600 defense that can't be normal summoned or set, and must be special summoned by a card effect. If this card is special summoned from the hand or deck, you can double this card's original attack and defense until the end of the next turn. And if this card is special summoned from the grave or banished zone, you can target a monster your opponent controls and destroy it. This is an interesting piece of design, but will make more sense once we get to the extra deck monsters. It being a special summon only monster that's level 4 is intensely infuriating, but the payoff is either removal or a potentially 4000 attack monster, which clears a lot more than you might think. In fact, in a world without the plethora of dragon support cards this could otherwise lean on, this would make for a pretty substantial boss monster. And that's not something I'm joshing about Andrake. World Legacy Guard Dragon Mardark is a level 9 wind dragon monster with 2600 attack and 3000 defense, and can be special summoned from the hand by banishing two normal monsters from your hand or grave. While on the field, your opponent's monsters lose 500 attack and defense for each dragon monster you control, and if this card on the field is destroyed by a battle or card effect, you can add from your grave to your hand a level 9 monster with a different original type and attribute than this card has. Dang, uh, I guess extracting the darkness from the dragon puppy had its consequences, huh? Mardark fits into the level 9 theme of the later World Legacy cards, but still does a fantastic job of fitting into guard dragons. The debuff can stack up fairly quickly, and with it already being at 2600, not a lot is gonna top this. 
but let's not forget that it also has a very good defense stat. So good on it for not only being a guard dragon that's actually a dragon, but is also good at guarding. I will, however, be docking points for being named Mar Dark and having the wind attribute, your tickets in the mail. Alright, that's all of our main deck monsters, now it's time to cover the extra deck ones. And this will be a fairly concise section, since we can talk about three of them in relatively quick succession. Gar Dragon LP is a Link 1 Dark monster, requiring a level 4 or lower Dragon monster as material. While on the field, you can't special summon monsters except dragons, and during your main phase, you can special summon a Dragon monster from your hand or deck to your zone that two or more Link monsters point to and you can only special summon Guard Dragon LPs once per turn. To complement that, we have Guard Dragon Pisty, who has all the same text as LP, but special summons one of your dragons that is either banished or is in your grave. Another notable piece of info is that LP has a left pointing arrow, while Pisty has a right pointing one. So the idea would be to place these two cards one zone away from each other to fulfill that requirement. This also brings to light exactly how you're supposed to use Andrake. If you don't have access to any better dragon payoffs, you can use either of their effects to get a massive beat stick or spot removal, depending on who you use to summon it. But we're not done yet, because next is Guard Dragon Agrapain, a Link 2 dragon monster with 1500 attack, requiring any two dragon monsters as material, and it has all the same text as the past two links, but summons a dragon directly from the extra deck to an extra monster zone or main monster zone that has the same arrow requirements. With an upward and downward pointing arrow, this is most comfortable in the EMZ, with either LP, Pisty, or both pointing to the zone right beneath it. Though keep in mind that none of these monsters have to summon to a zone they point to on top of their other requirements. So if there's another viable zone completely isolated from your guard dragons, these effects are still live. So so, having seen these, you can probably guess what kind of tomfoolery was committed with these cards. LP dragged out free dragons from the deck like Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, while Pisty could get back used dragons like Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, even if they had been banished at some point for a card like Chaos Dragon Levianir. Gosh, I am so happy they finally eroded Red Mid. But Agar Pain was the worst of the bunch, because as it turns out, there are a lot of good dragons in the game that live in the extra deck. Thankfully, some of the most egregious ones like the Delta Excel monsters must be Synchro Summoned, which this doesn't bypass, but you could still get your hands on Crystal Wing Synchro Dragon, Ancient Fairy Dragon, or probably the scariest of them all, Boral and Dragon. And that's why most of these cards are now banned, with you being unable to play Agar Pain and Elpy, which is pretty funny, since the Link 1s act as the wings to the Link 2, I'm now imagining Pisty just flopping around like a wet noodle to get anywhere, it's kind of funny. Our last extra deck specimen is World Chalice Dragon Almerdu, a level 9 wind fusion monster with 3000 attack and 2600 defense, requiring 3 Link monsters as material. It must first either be fusion summoned, or special summoned from your extra deck by tributing the above cards you control in which case, you don't use Polymerization. This card can attack all monsters your opponent controls once each, and when an attack is declared involving this card and an opponent's monster, you can banish a Link monster with the same Link rating as that monster from your field or grave to destroy that opponent's monster, and if you do, inflict damage to your opponent equal to its original attack. This is another holdover from the World Chalice video, and we found ourselves in an interesting position because this works equally well with both themes. If all of the Guard Dragon Links were still legal, you could do all of your summon cheating shenanigans, then turn all of them into this massive monster. At which point, if your opponent has any Link 1 or 2 monsters, they become quite easily dispatched. If ever a giant Link spam deck ever becomes popular, expect this to come out both as counterplay or as a potential payoff. But until then, this Duke is still decidedly dethroned. Alright, now that we've taken an extra deck break, let's get back to the main deck and talk about some spells and traps. Guard Dragon Reincarnation is a quick play spell card that fusion summons any fusion monster from your extra deck by banishing materials listed on it that are all link monsters from your field or grave. So, as a battle trick, this is pretty saucy. Attack with a whole bunch of link monsters, then cash them all in for a 3000 attack monster to do even more damage. Heck, if you've been link climbing and you have three in the grave offhand, then that's all the material you need, right? there. This is clearly meant as a way to summon Almer Duke, though because the only requirement is that the material be Link Monsters, you could potentially make a huge range of fusions with this card. I'll uh, leave it up to you to find out what wacky hijinks you can get up to by splashing this into other themes like, oh, I don't know, Altergeist, but the bottom line is that any Link deck can have access to Almer Duke with this card, 
without having to tribute them right off of the field, meaning they have a funny little anecdote and potentially a really profitable IP. That time I got reincarnated as a guard dragon. World Legacy Guard Dragon is a continuous spell card that, when activated, can target a level 4 or lower dragon monster in your grave and add it to your hand or special summon it. And once per turn, you can target a dragon monster you control and move that monster you control to another of your main monster zones. Whenever you bring up busted guard dragon cards, this has to be at the top of your mind because this is outrageous. It being usable to recover any level 4 or lower dragon means you get to revive cards like Rocket Tracer or Red Rose Dragon, both of which are absolute bops to have back in rotation. Heck, Rocket Tracer can even use this card as fodder for its summoning effect. The icing on top is the zone changing effect, letting you align your guard dragon links, uh, or I guess link singular nowadays, without having to worry about how your link arrows determine where you initially summon them. And because it's a World Legacy card, it can be searched by a variety of other effects. So not only is it powerful, it's very accessible. It's also just good to know that Imduck here is going to be okay. I already have a hard enough time dealing with the damage sound effect for it on Master Duel, making its passing a key part of the theme would have just been really cool. Guard Dragon Shield is a field spell card that has you targeting a dragon monster you control, and it gains attack and defense equal to the total link rating of all link monsters currently on the field times 100 until the end of your opponent's turn. And once per turn, if exactly one dragon monster you control would be destroyed by a battle or guard effect, you can send a normal monster from your hand or deck to the grave instead. Now, this is actually really funny to me, because even if you get or could get all three of your on-theme link monsters onto the board, this only gets you a 400 point boost, which isn't exactly thrilling. It does count link ratings in general, including your opponents, but for on-theme, this card isn't giving you much of a boost, though that can always be bolstered by off-theme monsters. The protection effect is much more interesting, because if you send that normal monster to the grave, you can special summon Promenesis from the grave and Garmides from hand, all while giving you a little extra padding against interaction. And thank goodness that effect is decent, because if the shield part of Guard Dragon Shield didn't function, I'd have to go get a refund. Guard Dragon Cataclysm is a normal trap card that tributes a dragon monster, then targets two cards on the field and destroys them. Yep, it's a dragon flavored Icarus attack. A slightly worse Icarus attack since this has a hard once per turn restriction on it, but considering the designers actually know how to use those now, it makes sense. There isn't much more to say here from a mechanic standpoint, don't be surprised if this crops up in a few dragon lists in the future, but what's cool from a lore perspective is that we get a global view of the planet here. And while the cloud cover is super annoying, you can tell where each world legacy is at, and thus where each battle took place. The center impact zone has World Wand and Arc, the north has Lance and Shield, to the south we have Chalice, Crown is to the east, and armors to the west. You can tell by matching up the colors to the kind of lighting that each world legacy item has. And they said that geography isn't fun. Um, okay, I guess it's just this geography that's fun. Guard Dragon Core Awakening is a continuous trap card that lets you send an effect monster from your hand to the grave to special summon a level 4 or lower dragon normal monster from your hand, deck, or grave in defense position. Hey, that's pretty neat! Normal monsters, by their very nature, don't contribute much to how a deck functions. If a deck focuses on them, the other effects have to basically bend themselves over backwards to make them work. But with Core Awakening, you can effectively run as few copies as possible, then trade in effect monsters whenever you need to get a normal into rotation. Not to mention it works works really well with World Legacy Guard Dragon, letting you revive any level 4 or lower effect dragon that you pitch. And being usable on both players' turns is a nice touch to help you get blockers. Though, you know, it is a trap card, and since the effect isn't hugely impactful enough to warrant the speed, you might not see or use it very much. But these multi-attribute dragons need all the help they can get, so make sure not to hit that snooze button, because this card is essential for waking up your elemental guard dragons. So, that's all the Guard Dragon cards, but what do we do with them? Well, competitive events have answered this pretty handily. Take the parts that make Dragon Link work, and scrap the rest. But this is the Golden Nova Yu-Gi-Oh! channel, where we try to find a way to make the core deck work. So while we'll be leaning on generic Dragon support, we'll try to see how we can get Dragons and Normals to come together in beautiful harmony. So what can we play to help them out? Well, the intersection of Normal and Dragon brings to mind a very specific monster, which is why I'm calling for Tri-Horned Guard Dragon to be a new premier deck for the format. Okay, uh, coping aside, Blue Eyes and Red Eyes both fit the bill extraordinarily well. 
However, with the Guard Dragon Links having been limited to just Pisty, it's only going to help you revive any that you already have in rotation. The good news is that both decks have great engines for throwing them into the graveyard, giving you an outlet to activate the effects of Promenesis and Garmides. But if we want to broaden our horizons a bit, Hieratic also lines up a lot with what Guard Dragons want to do. That deck tosses out Dragon Normal monsters at the drop of a hat, and with access to a Tum, you've got a bevy of dragons you can call on for reinforcements. An interesting bit of synergy actually comes from our friends over in Crusadia, as Spatha feels like it was custom made as a backup World Legacy Guard Dragon. If you summon Crusadia Draco to its link point, you can link it into Pisty, then Spatha's effect can move it one zone over. And now, the Dragon Summon effect is online, because you have its side pointing arrow and Spatha's downward pointing arrow, which lets you get back Draco. Sadly, you're locked into summoning dragons until you get Pisty off the board, so you can either make a Link 2 dragon, or you can combine all of them together to make Boral Sword Dragon, whichever fits your fancy. We also can't forget about how they interact with World Chalice. Remember, most of the guard dragons care about normal monsters in general, not just dragon ones. So whenever you send members of that theme to the grave for Link summoning, that gets you a guard dragon activation. Not to mention there are, you know, two members of their theme in that archetype. Like with Orcist, Guard Dragon Spell and Trap support isn't hidden among the World Legacy cards, but Monstrosity is great for getting Mardark out of the hand, Succession is always a bop, and World Legacy's Corruption gives you a replacement monster if your Guard Dragon links get offed. As for what World Legacy monsters would make for good techs, World Arc is a great way to save your links and foolish your own cards, World Armor is always nifty for getting the World Legacy spells and traps, and World Lance can help your tiny monsters win out in battle, even against the largest of foes. And of course, we can't forget about Lib, the World Key Blade Master as it does a great job of deploying those World Legacy spells and traps, especially if you incorporate the World Legacy monsters. As for a silly tech pick, well, I mean it is a dragon theme, and we do have every attribute aside from light. So let's bring in Five-Headed Dragon. Link climb a whole bunch, then cash them all in for a 5,000 attack and defense body with Dragon's Mirror. Or if you get them all out onto the field at once, you could link them into Five-Headed Link Dragon instead. That way you can board wipe your opponent. You know, for fun. And that's all I have to say about Guard Dragons. While I'm optimistic about most archetypes and their potential future, it's hard to look at this theme and see a positive outlook. The main deck monsters aren't very impactful, and without two of their three power links, the deck has even less of a leg to stand on than before. Maybe Guard Dragons will find themselves incorporated into future support for other World Legacy themes, or maybe even get a massive rework themselves. But until such times come to pass, for all the enjoyers of these cards, it's gonna be a bit of a drag. So what's the deal with the World Legacy? Well, a majority of their main deck monsters are Dark Machines, meaning they have a pretty big overlap with Orcist. But the strange thing is, despite having a consistent type and attribute, these cards are more focused on supporting other archetypes in the World Legacy lore. While some will have minor connective tissue, allowing for some kind of World Legacy deck to be made, that's not really where their main focus is going to be on. So, for the sake of this video, I'll be including all of the Dark Machine World Legacy monsters. However, there are a number of spell and trap cards I'll be skipping over, because many of them are either explicit or implicit support for a different World Legacy archetype. Not only would they not mesh really well with the monsters shown here, I've probably already talked about them in another video covering that theme. Besides, I've already made my puns for those, and I have to conserve my comedic juices. There's over 10,000 of these cards in the game for crying out loud. So, with that explanation out of the way, let's get to work on these worldly wonders. World Legacy World Key is a level 1 monster with 0 attack and defense, and it can discard a World Legacy card to give you an additional tribute summon during your main phase, but you can only gain this effect once per turn. At the start of the damage step, if this card battles an opponent's Link monster, you can return that monster to the extra deck. That extra tribute summon is going to become very relevant, since the rest of our World Legacies are going to be on the higher end of the level spectrum. Though technically, this can be used to tribute summon anything, so I guess World Legacy Monarch isn't entirely off the table? Being a Neospatian Grand Mole for Link monsters is also pretty cool, though it is unfortunate that it doesn't bounce itself as well, so it is vulnerable to basically anything else. Seriously, if your sword can be broken by a Karibo, I think you need to consider getting a refund. World Legacy World Chalice is a level 5 monster with 0 attack and defense, and if any number of monsters are special summoned from the extra deck, except during the damage step, you can tribute this card to send those monsters to the grave. 
If this face-up normal summoned or set card leaves the field, you can special summon two World Chalice monsters from your deck, except copies of this card, and during your main phase, except the turn this card was sent to the grave, you can banish this card from your grave to add a World Legacy card from your deck to your hand. So in World Chalice decks, normal summoning this with Imduck is one of the most important lines of play in your theme. But if you're looking to use this for its other applications, you don't have to worry about normal summoning it. It'll still be a deterrent to extra deck summoning, though it oddly doesn't negate the summon, and acts as a searcher for World Legacy cards on future turns. So if you need an on-theme monster, spell, or trap card, this cup is gonna be aces. World Legacy World Crown is a level 6 monster with 2000 attack and defense that can be special summoned from the hand in defense position to your zone a link monster points to. When a monster on the field that was special summoned from the extra deck activates its effect as a quick effect, you can tribute this card to negate the activation and if you do, destroy it. And if this normal summoner set card is tributed, you can add a World Legacy Speller Trap card from your deck to your hand. So you'll notice some similarities with World Chalice here, letting you mess with extra deck summoned monsters and having an effect when it leaves the field based on if you normal summoned or set it. In its intended theme, Crusadia, it's really just another link climbing tool, though it has that nifty negate on hand if you wanted to keep it on board instead. And while it might seem a tad wasteful to always special summon it using its own effect, since that bypasses the search, you have so many other ways to tutor out your world legacy cards that you aren't really missing out on much, so feel free to drop this out of your hand as you see fit. It's pretty good in Crusadia, but when it comes to the world legacy, this card isn't exactly a crown jewel. World Legacy World Shield is a level 6 monster with 0 attack and 3000 defense that's unaffected by the activated effects of monster special summon from the extra deck. Your opponent can't target your World Legacy cards in this card's column with card effects, also they can't be destroyed by your opponent's card effects. During your standby phase, if this card is in your grave, you can pay 1000 life points to special summon this card, then your opponent can special summon a monster from their hand or grave. Now that sounds very unwise. You front the cost and get what amounts to a giant butt, while your opponent gets their best monster from their hand or grave. Heck, whatever monster is summoned is going to be able to affect shield because even if it's something like a synchro monster, it was summoned from the grave, not the extra deck. Though, thankfully, it will always benefit from its own targeting and effect destruction protection, so at least there's that. It's also nice that it can protect the World Legacy Continuous Spell and Trap cards that are common in Mech Knights, the archetype that released alongside this one. And speaking of which, while giving your opponent a monster in most scenarios is terrible, it does occupy a zone, which can help you summon out your Mech Knights from your hand, so it's not a total wash. But that won't stop me from trying to block this from my World Legacy's memories. World Legacy World Arc is a level 7 monster with 2500 attack and 500 defense, and can be counted as two tributes for the tribute summon of any monster. If any number of Link monsters you control are destroyed by an opponent's card effect and sent to the grave, except during the damage step, you can send this card from your hand to the grave, then target one of those Link monsters and special summon it. And if your opponent special summons any number of monsters from the extra deck while this normal summoned or set card is on the field, except during the damage step, you can send a monster from your deck to the grave. Wow, that is a lot to unpack. So right off the bat, this being two whole tributes can enable Ark and any other level 7 or higher world legacy to get their normal summon effects online, without itself necessarily having to be normal summoned. So cheating this into play to set those up is going to be choice. But you're more than likely to use this for the hand trap effect, letting you recover link monsters lost to your opponent's effect destruction removal. The foolish burial effect is kind of cool, though not exactly impactful enough for the effort of getting this normal summoned monster onto the field. Let's just say that out of the entire story, this easily has the least interesting arc. World Legacy World Armor is a level 7 monster with 2500 attack and defense, and when a monster is flip summoned, you can special summon this card from your hand. If this card is normal or special summoned, you can add a World Legacy card from your deck to your hand, and if this normal summoned or set card is on the field as a quick effect, you can target a face-up opponent's monster that was special summoned from the extra deck, and return both that monster and this card to the hand. This is a pretty good all-rounder. Crawlers are the preferred method of getting this card out of your hand because you know, flip monsters, but we've got a surprising number of other tools that can summon this, which means you get more World Legacy cards. The normal summon effect is also pretty powerful because this is a Grand Mole at quick effect speed, except without having to go to the battle phase, which means getting another chance to summon this and getting another search. Of our two tribute World Legacies, this is probably the least unwieldy, which is impressive considering how big it is. Do you know how much metal it would take to cover the whole world in armor? Uh, well, neither do I, but I'm sure it's a lot. 
World Legacy World Lance is a level 8 monster with 3000 attack and 0 defense, and monsters your opponent controls can't attack World Legacy monsters you control except this one. During damage calculation, if a Link monster battles another monster as a quick effect, you can discard this card so that the opponent's battling monster loses 3000 attack. And if any number of monsters are special summoned from the extra deck, special summon a World Legacy token to both players' field and defense position, which is a level 1 Dark Machine monster with zero attack and defense. Hey, that's the same kind of token you make with Gear Sue the Orcus Mech Knight! Gotta love that attention to detail. This makes for a very funny hand trap against Link decks to beat basically anything in battle, but as it stands in the proper theme, it keeps your weaker legacies from being run over, including those little tokens. And while classically those tokens would be used for Link summoning purposes, they have a special purpose for us, Tribute Fodder. With these little gizmos, we now have an easier way to get our World Legacies normal summoned so their effects can be unlocked. That means you have everything you need to take full advantage of these cards, since everything you need is Right Spear. World Legacy World Wand is a level 8 monster with 500 attack and 2500 defense, and this normal summoned or set card cannot be destroyed by battle with a monster special summon from the extra deck. If this card is sent to the grave, you can special summon a World Legacy monster from your hand, and you can banish this card from your hand, then target one of your banished Orcus monsters and special summon it. Also, you can't special summon monsters for the rest of the turn, except Dark Monsters. In Orcus, this made for another great way to get you material while recycling your banished Orcus to reset their effects. It worked particularly well with Orcus Nightmare, which funnily enough has its own form of battle destruction protection, as it could banish itself to send a Dark Monster from deck to grave, meaning you could send World Wand, which could in turn revive Nightmare. But if you were playing any other World Legacies, this would also get a monster out of your hand. And while a few work best when normal summoned, Armor will still get you a search, and Lance is another huge body with other utility. Heck, because the World Legacies are all Dark and Machine, they could be summoned even if any Orcus summon restrictions were in place. It might seem far-fetched that the Tuba Drone and the Percussion Zombie have anything to do with the planet's manifestation of ancient power, but that's the magic of lore. Our last two monsters are going to be some related links. Liv, the World Key Blade Master, is a Link 2 Light Cybers monster with 2000 attack, requiring any two monsters as material, but can only be Link summoned while you have a World Legacy card in your grave. During your main phase, you can set a World Legacy spell or trap card directly from your deck, but it cannot be activated this turn while you have no World Legacy monsters in your grave. And if this Link Summoned card is sent to the grave as Link Material, you can shuffle a card on the field into the deck. So everything about this card reads as the quintessential rung in the Link Climbing Ladder. As long as you're on some kind of World Legacy card, any two monsters turn into one that gets you a free card, and when Lib is used as Material, they double as Removal. In fact, it was such an innovation in link climbing technology that it was the preferred material to make link cross with, giving you two tokens and a way to spin a card on the field back into the deck. And since link cross is basically the poster child for how link summoning ruined card advantage, well that means that Lib isn't exactly in very good company. Though that does speak to their tremendous power, though I expect nothing less from such an accomplished Keyblade Master. World Gears of Theological Demiurgy is a Link 3 Dark Cybers monster with 3500 attack, requiring 3 level 5 or higher monsters as material. This card can't be used as Link material, and this Link Summoned card is unaffected by other monsters' effects. During your main phase, if this card was Link Summoned using 3 monsters that had different types and attributes on the field, you can destroy all other cards on the field. And if your opponent special summons any number of monsters from the extra deck, except during the damage step, you can special summon a World Legacy monster from your deck. Now, you might be wondering something strange about that board wipe effect. If this is a World Legacy card, why doesn't it work with the World Legacies, since they're all the same type and attribute? Well, the intention is to try and use the level 9 monsters that were associated with the villains that were released alongside this card. Nightmare Reincarnation Idli, World Legacy Guard Dragon Mardark, and Deus Ex Crawler, but they have a more general level 9 synergy instead of working with the World Legacies. Even the one with World Legacy in its name is much more of a Guard Dragon card than anything else. This means that Gears is much more suited as an extra deck tech pick for anything that has a wide range of types and attributes among its ranks, as well as high levels, but the payoff is more than worth it, giving you a repeatable way to clear out your opponent's field, though at the cost of your own. But it's no slouch in World Legacies itself. Most of the monsters still qualify as material for the summon, has a ton of attack, is still unaffected by other monster effects, and acts as a way to pull World Legacy monsters out of your deck, 
It's pretty gimmicky, I admit, but sometimes you can't resist the demi urgy to play something janky. Alright, that's all the monsters, now it's time for the curated list of spells and traps. World Legacy Succession is a normal spell card that targets a monster in your grave and special summons it to your zone a link monster points to. A very succinct effect, and also very powerful. I feel like this got added to every video about the World Legacy themes, and for good reason. They are all basically link decks in one way or another, and with the number of searchers that can grab this card, it's a great link extender or board builder, helping you to buy back powerful on-theme threats. In just about every way, it's a Monster Reborn reskin for the Link era, and as far as retrains go, this one makes for a pretty good successor to its legacy. World Legacy Clash is a quick play spell card that banishes a face-up monster you control until the end phase, then targets a face-up monster your opponent controls, and that target loses attack and defense equal to the original attack and defense of that banished monster. With a lot of our World Legacies, this is going to cause a huge debuff, and it's even better when you remember that while your monsters phase out temporarily, the debuff is permanent. And because of the way temporary banishing works, you can banish one of your normal summoned World Legacies, and they'll still maintain the stat of having been normal summoned so they can still access those effects. Also, don't forget that this is completely generic, so if you have a theme that likes having their monsters banished, that's even more value. Oh, and because it's generic and is a card that modifies battle stats, you can actually flip this during the damage step, banishing a monster that's being attacked to save it, while still using up the attack of the attacking monster. It's pretty cool. There's a lot of utility bundled up in this little card, which clashes with its unassuming looks. World Legacy Monstrosity is a quick play spell card that lets you activate either one of two effects. You can special summon a level 9 monster from your hand, or you can target a level 9 monster you control to special summon from your deck two level 9 monsters, each with different types and attributes from that face-up targeted monster and with different names from each other, but those two monsters can't attack, also destroy them during the end phase. That's a real mouthful, but really, it boils down to either getting a level 9 out of your hand onto the field, or giving a level 9 you already have on field some friends. This is meant to work with the trio of level 9s I mentioned earlier in the video, Idli, Deus Ex, and Mardark, with that second effect basically making world gears all by itself. But considering how those three don't otherwise work too well with the world legacies, it'll be more useful in decks looking for level 9 synergies, like generators. It's also another reason why I'm glad VFD is banned. That was the real monster. The World Legacy is a continuous spell card that you can only control a single copy of. Each time any number of face-up level 5 or higher monsters are sent from the field to the grave, place a counter on this card for each card sent, and it can hold a maximum of 7. You can send this card with 7 counters to the grave to special summon a Cybers Link monster from your extra deck. This is another alternate way to summon out World Gears if you're going strictly by the lore, but we've actually got almost a hundred targets for its effect. Though thankfully most of the scarier targets only reach their full potential when actually Link summoned. I don't think you'll have to worry about them dragging Access Code Talker into the mix, and Avramax isn't anywhere near as good if it's not Link summoned, though a free Decode Talker Heat Soul wouldn't be half bad. The main problem here is setup. The World Legacy could add all five pieces of Exodia to your hand. The problem is that you have to summon and then send more level five monsters from the field to the grave than you actually have zones to fit them. So it's gonna be a long involved process. Maybe one day we'll have a big link spam deck that uses high level monsters that are easy to summon and the World Legacy ends up being a funny little extender you attack on to get some kind of toolbox effect. But until such times as the design team reaches into my little brain and pulls out that nugget of wisdom, the chapter chapter of this card story is closed. World Legacy's Corruption is a continuous spell card, and once per turn, if a face-up link monster you control is destroyed by a battle or leaves the field because of an opponent's card effect, you can special summon a World Legacy monster from your hand or deck in defense position, and you can only control a single copy of this card. This is largely meant to be used with Nightmares, an archetype primarily made of link monsters, but everyone was running those at the time, so it does kind of fit with everything. And it does specifically summon World Legacies, so, you know, what's a guy to do? It works especially well with the kinds of decks that are already running World Legacies for their inherent synergies, letting you float into a potentially large body to help keep your field stocked up. It's hard to turn down a free World Lance, especially when it can help you rebuild your board with those sweet tokens. Though if you're one of those people who only play archetypes pure and think splashing is a moral failing, you might find this to be a corruption of their card pool. 
World Legacy Bestowal is a normal trap card that activates one of two effects. You either send a Link monster your opponent controls to the grave, or banish seven World Legacy cards from your grave to add a Cybers monster from your deck to your hand. Another really interesting card, and I'm not quite sure which decks this is supposed to go into. The closest thing to obvious would be as a side deck pick against decks with impactful Link monsters that resist removal, and need some kind of non-targeting, non-destruction removal that you don't feel bad waiting a turn to activate. In fact, I'm sure that's what most people would ever use this for, because the second effect would require you to be playing a Highlander World Legacy deck to fit that many cards in there. 7 is 17% of a 40 card deck. It's more cards than you'll see in your opening hand even if you go first, and let's just say that not every World Legacy card is a banger. And like, to do what? Search a single Cybers monster? I can pitch a card and get level 4 or lower ones off of Synap Mining without having to wait a turn, and some archetypes already have effects that'll search those higher leveled ones. I have a sneaking suspicion that no one's willing to run so many cards, including this one, as a way to search out Threshold Borg. Now, when it comes to flavor, this card is a 10 out of 10, no question. It's a choice between either throwing it all away and letting the pain of failure and loss consume everything, or using the World Legacy's power to try and forge a new future, even if it means consuming the power so you can never use it again, thus showing probably the ultimate vulnerability of giving up reality-shaping power. But you try to tell that to someone who's got three negates live and lethal on board. Turns out, you can't lure your way through a tournament. Trust me, I've tried. It's not pretty. World Legacy Cliffhanger is a normal trap card that can be activated when an attack is declared involving two Link monsters. Shuffle all monsters on the field and in the graves into the decks, and for the rest of this turn, after this card resolves, neither player can Link summon. Um, okay, this doesn't really do anything. I just felt I had to include it because it doesn't really fit into any of the themes we've talked about beforehand. Like, Link monsters battling each other was a fairly common occurrence, and you could force this yourself, but because it's a trap card, it's far better for your opponent to walk into this. And yeah, I guess it's kinda cool to lock your opponent out of what was the most important extra deck summoning method, but it only effectively applying during main phase 2 isn't really a vibe. Like, they're gonna try and use all their resources during main phase 1 to beat you up, and part of that might be removal. So this card's fate isn't a cliffhanger, we know copies of these are going to slowly crumble to dust in someone's closet. Sad, but true. World Legacy Landmark is a normal trap card that banishes a World Legacy monster from your hand or face up from your field, then target two monsters in your grave and special summon them, but they cannot attack this turn. Now that's a restriction that isn't much of an issue, because if you use this on your opponent's turn, it's not going to mean much. I kind of debated on this one to be honest, but technically, while a bunch of World Chalice monsters are in this card, it doesn't specifically have to work with them, and actually kind of makes running gigantic monsters a bit more palatable, because you can feed them to this and get more monsters out of it, which is kind of goofy. Sadly, it never really caught on, but I'm sure someday it'll see some niche play to facilitate a new fangled World Legacy deck, so playing this will be a landmark decision. World Reassembly is a normal trap card that special summons a World Legacy monster from your hand or deck, but destroys it during the end phase of the next turn. Yeah, just get any of those big bunglers onto the board, nothing to it. Summon Armor to get a search, summon Shield to get the Reborn online, summon Chalice to punish your opponent for summoning from the extra deck. The world's getting reset anyway, have fun, the world is your oyster. And while I still have a few lines of text left in this paragraph, I will take this time to remind you that those rocks do in fact have wireframes on them, so we are in the dual terminal right now. And if I hear another word about how it having Cleefort parts is a coincidence, you're going to coincidentally find all your garnets in your opening hand next regional. I am no longer asking you to care about lore, this is an order. World Legacy Trap Globe is a normal trap card that shuffles five of your World Legacy cards into the deck with different names from your banished zone, hand, grave, and or face upon the field, except copies of this card, then draw two cards. Aside from the fact that this is a trap card, this is basically Power Crept Pot of Avarice. You don't target any of the cards, you just choose which ones get shuffled on resolution, and because it can grab banished cards, your opponent can't just banish your fifth option to stop this. This means we can recycle chalices and wands that have been banished, which is really keen, as well as other powerful cards stuck in our grave. 
all while refilling our grip with a sweet plus one. I just wish we didn't have to wait to get that sweet, juicy card advantage. But I guess we don't really have time to worry about that because we have more pressing matters. They put Ib in the contraption! We gotta get her out of there. World Legacy Collapse is a continuous trap card, and it can banish a World Legacy monster from your hand, grave, or face-up field, then target a Link monster on the field, and it gains attack equal to the original attack of the banished monster, even if this card leaves the field. And if any number of Link monsters you control are destroyed by a battle or an opponent's card effect while this card is in your grave, you can banish this card to special summon a Cybers Link monster from your grave. Now, notably, World Gears is only unaffected by monster effects, so if you've got Collapse, you can start feeding it more and more World Legacies until it just eclipses your opponent. And that boost is permanent, so that orb you've been pondering is just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. And Collapse can even get you back gears if Collapse hits the grave before that Link monster, so it gets a second chance. And even though it'll lose its protections, it's still huge and can still get your World Legacy monsters. Sure, it can summon any Cybers Link monster out of your grave, but let's be real, it's much more geared towards Demiurgy. Alright, so that's all the World Legacy cards, but what do we do with them? Well, um... Yeah, this section is kind of a wash. These were always meant to have an overarching amount of synergy, but don't really have their own playstyle or win condition. Even Demiurgy wants you to play different monsters than these to unlock its full power. Really, they're more of a bridge that other themes like Crusadia or Orcist can use to access cards they otherwise wouldn't have. And I cover all the relevant ones in their individual videos, so... Uh, let's go ahead and go to the Nova Scale. Novelty. An admittedly clunky term I like to use that comes up in lore archetypes is World Legacyfication, where multiple themes in a single storyline begin sharing pieces of support. You can see it in Visus with the Kashtira Scareclaw and Tearlament monsters, and you can see it in Albaz with cards like Sprite Smashers. And it all kind of originated in this era of the game, so World Legacies have got to get a 5 in novelty from me. Objectivity. None of these cards individually are particularly busted. While they provide powerful and necessary functions to decks like World Chalice and Orcist, I'd be hard-pressed to say that any of them are individually game-changing, to say nothing of what their coordinated group can do. So I'm giving them a 5 here as well for being perfectly, palatably powerful. Versatility well, the whole point of these cards is to flex into a number of different decks, though the ones they work in are very narrowly the World Legacy lore themes, so they don't exactly have a wide range. Dark Machine support can kinda work with these as well, but it's not super explosive. So World Legacy is gonna get a 3 from me in versatility. Awesomeness. Uh, this might be a hot take, but the World Legacy cards are kinda boring. The strong ones tend to be really strong and homogenized gameplay, at least for its time, and the mediocre ones might as well not exist. And while their individual effects tying into their connected archetypes is kinda cool from a lore perspective, none of them really enrich the story in any meaningful way. I'll give them points for being the glue that holds all this together, but for now, this is getting a 2 in awesomeness, though if my theories of a combined World Legacy Megazord ever come to fruition, and no, Avita does not count, expect this to go up a few points higher, because that would be rad. This puts World Legacy at a comfortable 15 out of 20 on the Nova scale, a score I did not expect for them to get going into this, to be honest. And that's all I have to say about World Legacy. I know things kind of got a little wonky there at the end, but if any archetype embodies the idea of being a tech pick as its gimmick, it's World Legacy. And it does mean a lot to be the cards that add flavor, texture, and function to a theme, even if it doesn't end up being very flashy. But I'm going to go ahead and do another of my classic called shots. The story is not over, not by a long shot. The blatant references to Dual Terminal without a cohesive connection is just begging for a follow-up, and I'd love to see how it all fits together. It may be wishful thinking, but if I go down as the guy who keeps coping that the story team will give us actual, concrete details about their world and won't just keep teasing us forever, well, I can think of worse legacies than that. But now, I want to hear what you all have to say. Do the World Legacies have more depth than I've given them credit for, or are these Rust Buckets best kept where they are? And which one's your favorite? I feel like Armor has the most interesting art, and I'm dying to know why its shield and spear landed so far away from it. Let me know in the comments, and if you haven't already, please make sure to like this video, subscribe so you don't miss an episode, and share this video with somebody you know who loves Yu-Gi-Oh! It really does a lot to help me out. Today's episode was brought to you in part by Dragon Shield. When you want to protect your cards with the power of Dragon 
dragon scales, get some sweet lore for them, and support the channel, check out my link in the description to get started. Today's episode is also brought to you by my lovely patrons, including the illustrious Quasar Commander Green Knight, Nebula Navigator's Third Dynasty, Ada Basilisk, Adam Zajdel, Andrew Newman, Avi Chali, Kane Senpai, Chibi Gohan, Christopher Fuss, Clockswork, Danny Bound, Dark Dragon X830, Eric, Aaron the World Breaker, Frankie, Garland Chaos, Genesis Yukio, Great Big Pillock, Hairbear, Harry the Ominous Benefactor, Howling Zangetsu, Hydrocraft 135, Iron Zero, Iskander 711, Mana Charge, Marion James E. Bacata, Marluxia is a Girl, Mega Combi, Molly Renata, Nathan Vig, Orozco 09096, Panther J, Rebel King Lucifer, RJ the Jank Monarch, Sammy Haim, Sir Knight JCB, Skybuster Leo, Sophie, apparently, The Wizard Moose and Xander Wolfensberger, Cosmic Crusaders Almento 5010, A Random Pup, Ariel Kersey, Beluga Masta, Blue Gem, Chaz Ghost, Corbinisms, Drakenwald, Drake and SpongeBob be like, you used to call me on your shell phone. Dripfed Tar, Eki Bullock, Eva Padilla, Hike Boyajian, Herbal D, Inblink, Jester Designs, Kale the Dragon, Carp, Kivon Public, King Scarlet Yu Gi Oh!, Lemon Yu Gi Oh!, Lord Whoop De Doo, Manga Pages, Matt Simmons, Michael Shimabukuro, Nitromo, Ruxith Sarani, Shizuka Nijimura, Stephen Williamson, The Legendary Raven, Tucker Ordorn, Venusian Teapot, and Zeldreka, as well as the wonderful Starlight Explorers you see on screen now. If you'd like to be a part of these credits, get early access to videos, determine what videos I make, and many more benefits, it would mean the world to me if you check my Patreon page in the description or consider joining as a YouTube member. And if you'd like to take this journey back from the beginning, check out this playlist of all the World Legacy Archetype videos. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Buh bye. And while I still have a few lines of text left in this paragraph, I will take this time to remind you that those rocks do in fact have wireframes on them, so we are in them. Uh.